Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 26th meeting of 2018. We have no apologies. Item one is a decision to take in private. Does the committee agree to take agenda item eight in private today as this relates to our approach to forthcoming SSI? No, agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is an evidence session on post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. This morning we'll be focusing on the views of the unions and staff associations, representing both the police and fire services. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome Chief Superintendent Ivor Marshall, President of the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents, Chris McLone, Executive Council Member, the Fire Brigade Union, Stuart Aiken, Fire and Rescue Services Association, Callum Steele, General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation, and Derek Jackson, Branch Secretary, Fire Rescue Service Branch, Unison Scotland. Can I thank all the um, all the witnesses for their written submissions, which are always really, really helpful for the committee prior to you, you appearing today. And um, also thank you for managing to um, to negotiate the, the train um, problems, which I know some of you had and, and managed to be here on time. We'll go straight to questions from members, starting with Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, can I start by asking um, you all if you think the initial case for reform put forward by the Scottish Government for both services was sound? And did you have any concerns about the initial case for reform at the time? And if so, do these concerns persist? Just maybe Who'd go like right, to left start? to right? Or, yeah. no. uh, thank, you, thank you, Convener. Um, I think in many, in, in many cases we have to look at the realities of what... Uh, existed in terms of the, the public sector landscape at the time of reform uh, or the time of the case for reform was being developed and that was the, the onset of, its, of austerity uh, or certainly the onset of austerity from a, a Scottish perspective because the reality of, was, of diminishing budgets had started to take effect a number of years previously. Now what I, I think uh, was probably unfortunate at that time is that the reality of austerity uh, and what it was meaning for public sector finances was not front and centre of the arguments for reform. Uh, much was made and created around about improvement of services and so on and so forth, whereas in reality, if services were going to be improved, uh, reform would have stood alone uh, many, many years earlier than it, than, than it did. Uh, in fact, from a policing perspective, the former Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Kenny McCaskill, uh, was on record more times than he would care to remember, I suspect, uh, saying that were it not for austerity, uh, he would not have pursued uh, the argument for the creation of a single police service. Uh, so, you know, I think that's always important context when it comes to anything to do with the police and uh, equally uh, also through of the, the fire and rescue service. So, in terms of delivering a, a better or more effective policing uh, police service, I, I mean, to some extent, I think it has compared to what we would have been facing had we not done it. Uh, but whether uh, policing is better now than it was uh, a number of years ago, uh, certainly before the creation of the single service, if you look absent the reality of finance, uh, by any measure, uh, in some areas it is much better and in other areas it is not better. Uh, but the, the, but what, Would that be due to the changing nature of policing, perhaps? Uh, no, I, I don't believe it does. <coughs> you know, p policing is a, is, a, is a profession which uh, you know, changes uh, dynamically on a daily basis. Uh, the police service has always been uh, adept at, at dealing with that. Uh, there's, there's certainly been a change in the demand upon the police service. There's, you know, I don't think anyone would, would, pretend, uh, would pretend otherwise. Uh, uh, but in terms of uh, some of the difficulties that, uh, or, or some of the, the challenges that, that prevail today, there's still uh, uh, undoubtedly as a consequence of a business case which did not take uh, due cognizance of the realities of what we were facing. Um, I'm sure my colleagues from Unison um, either at a previous session or a se session that will follow this one will make the, the case that the, the outline business case uh, was seriously flawed in terms of the financial savings that were uh, contained within it. Uh, those financial savings were also drawn against what you could probably call a routine 
whatever routine is, but certainly a routine policing environment, and certainly didn't take cognizance of the realities of a terrorist threat, which didn't exist to the same extent as it does now, and the demands that that is uh, placed upon the police service. And it certainly didn't take into, cognizance, into, um, into consideration the realities of what the service was going to, uh, was going to uncover uh, when it looked below the bonnet of the former police services and the state of uh, much of what they left for the service to deal with. Thank you. Mr Jackson. Just basically on that, obviously I can't speak, I'm speaking on behalf of support staff here and that, uh, but it's been, obviously if we're into year six now, the new service uh, has been, it's been very hard, uh, trying conditions. There's been a lot of change uh, thrown at our staff. And I think through sheer dedication and loyalty to the services, uh, if the, the services came through better. Uh, the only thing is there's obviously a lot of things where uh, through strategic intent there's been buildings closed uh, so people have found them their workplaces having to travel maybe a considerable amount of time as opposed to what they used to so work life balance kind of side of things has changed a bit uh, but in, in general there's, there is benefits there I, I think it Compared to the old way, the eight services, certainly from Unison's point of view, uh, it is a benefit that we get uh, recognition within the service. Uh, we set up a lot of forums and tables and uh, boards and, and meetings as such. Uh, so I would, I would say that was of a benefit. But there are still people uh, for five years, well, in the last five years, we went through significant change, uh, mainly so. T's and C's, the terms and conditions, they were agreed 2015. We've went through a job evaluation process, which left, as previously stated here, left a considerable amount of people in detriment. Uh, people have left the service because, obviously, they couldn't, they couldn't afford to work for the service, and that has been a lot of knowledge, corporate knowledge, uh, expertise, and that we've, we've lost over the last five, six years. Uh, Sometimes specific jobs we, we are struggling to, to actually fill. Uh, for outside that, we've, we've introduced a, a marketplace supplement as well to try and encourage people to come for private sector in. Uh, but as I said, overall there is there's a lot of there's negatives there as well. But as I said, we recognise the fact that we, as a union, we get involved a lot more, uh, sitting at, at forums and tables and as I said, boards and meetings and that. Uh, there's a staff survey out at the minute that concludes, I think, it's Sunday. So it'll be interesting to see the outcome for that. Uh, hopefully, we've been trying our best to get uh, <coughs> members to encourage them to take part in it, because if the service doesn't know it's, it's not working, how are they meant to fix it? So uh, I think a lot of people are kind of sitting back just thinking it's the same old, same old, just with what's happened in the last five years. The trust side of things and that within support staff side is, is kind of lost. Uh, morale, as I say, that, that should hopefully come through in this survey. It, it concludes, as I say, on the 28th of this month. So. It's encouraging to hear that you have more of a voice at board meetings, etc. Yeah, OK. Mr well, Marshall? Sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Um, I think in relation to your uh, part, one of your questions was the business or was the case the initial case sound. Um, again, I think it's important to remember the context at that time. It's easy to sort of look back with um, um, hindsight and rose tinted spectacles and forget some of it. There were significant um, operational drivers for change. Um, the need to build capability and capacity across um, policing uh, in general. Um, and I think the evidence that we've seen over the last five and a half years is that that has been uh, a success as far as creating um, that ability to respond to major threats, changing threats, um, particularly around about national security, counter-terrorism, um, and some of the more strategic issues. Um, I think there were definitely financial drivers at the time. Uh, Mr Steele's already referred to that um, the austerity measures which started to affect um, uh, public sector in Scotland and, and that was a significant driver or felt as if it was a sig significant driver in terms of the actual change process. Um, personally, I think the business case, the financial business case, um, 
hasn't stood up to the test of time in that the projected savings um, that were part of that business case have not been realised. Um, the services had to operate with a structural deficit in its budget for the past five or six years and transformation budget that was intended to, to make the changes um, was used to patch up that shortfall. Some of the constraints around the fixed costs of um, 17,234 officers um, made it extremely difficult to achieve some of those savings. Um, so concerns around about that um, have persisted. Um, thankfully, it looks as if that has is, is started to be addressed um, by the service um, so that we're operating on a sustainable budget footing just now. Um, but there still needs to be investment to actually move from integration to true transformation. Um, so that's still a, an ongoing piece of work. Um, there were concerns and continue to be concerns, I suppose, about the scale, complexity and scope of the change and the pace at which it was initially conducted. Um, the time scale from introduction of the bill to going live was very short for the scale of the change. And as I say, we're still living with the consequences of that change five to, five to six years later. Um, so those, I think, in some ways, um, and my key points around about it, there was definitely a focus on the sort of structural procedural elements. Um, and I think that's been recognised and, and conceded as well that um, for a business which is really about <coughs> people, uh, people delivering services to the citizens of Scotland, there wasn't really a focus on the, the people side of it and the, the officers and staff. Um, thankfully, as I say, that's now started to be recognised and addressed and the readiness for change in the hearts and minds of the officers and staff was probably overlooked in the first three to four years. Okay, thank you. Mr Aiken. Good morning. Um, I think broadly it was welcomed, the change to the one fire service. However, the potential benefits that, that could have been brought to it, i.e. Um, more resources, standardisation of practices, that really hasn't come. I mean, we're still talking about harmonisation and transformation. They haven't been sorted in, in our uh, terms yet, or sorry, in terms of the fire service. The, the retained service come across as unique problems. They come across with real problems with recruitment and retention. That goes way back before the one fire service. Indeed, there was parliamentary reviews into it back as far as 2003. To fix that when you come across the one fire service is what we hoped. The financial restraints that have been placed, I don't think it's possible, and it's shown that it isn't possible. Uh, we, still, we still suffer from lack of training, lack of equipment. These just have not materialised. The whole picture, yes, I think it can be done, but it hasn't been done so far. OK. Mr McGlone. Uh, good morning, convener committee. Uh, I think from the... <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the fire service point of view, I think the Christie Commission sounded the, the initial alarm and set the context for the, you know, the, 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 the merge of the, the organisations, whether you agreed with the, you know, the contents of the Christie Commission uh, and the, the issues that were raised in there. But you know, the, the, the language of the Christie Commission, innovate, innovate, collaborate, transform, or you just will not continue to survive in your, your, your current form, I think, set us all, set the hairs running and, and set the, the pace, if you like, of that initial reform and the move into the, the consultation on where the fire and rescue service goes. Certainly, the, the initial case, I, I think, was fairly sound and it was supported initially by the Fire Brigade Union. Um, whether or not it was the, it's the best option now, I think it, it appeared to us to be the best option at the time. Would, would we look at it differently now, looking back after five, six years? Possibly, would we look at a three service structure instead of a single service structure? Possibly because of the, you know, the, the size of our country, 50 odd thousand square miles. It's a massive country with a lot of diversity, right, you know, from the central belt into remote rural, etc. So am I convinced that the single service at the moment completely serves uh, those diverse communities? Possibly not at the moment, but they obviously are, are, you know, are looking into the aspects where it might not, and the, the retained duty service is, cl is, is clearly one of them. Um, so, I, for, for, for ourselves, I think the, the, to, answer, to answer the second part of the question, I, I think I probably have to make reference to the, you know, the three main policy intentions in the Act for the Fire and Rescue Service. 
And, and we've obviously provided a significant degree of evidence within our submission, and I'm quite sure panel members might be, be interested in exploring that at some point through the session. Thank you. Can I just ask very briefly, if, if you could briefly just um, give your opinion on the issues that you've raised, do you think that they would not be there had the, the legacy forces remained and the, and the single force hadn't come into being? Do you think you would not be having the problems, some of the problems that you've, you've highlighted? I think, the, I, I think the creation of single service itself is, is clearly and will always uh, be going to throw up its own set of problems and, uh, and, and unique um, issues. I don't really think we, we had a choice at the time, uh, to be honest. I think uh, uh, Callum painted a bit of the context of the, you know, the, the fiscal and the financial background at the time and the difficulties that the whole country was facing uh, with regards to you know, just financing our public uh, services and public sector. I think some of the some of the, the previous antecedent services would have been in real would have been in real trouble by now, and we're actually in the process of being bailed out by others. If I'm being absolutely honest, so I don't think some of those original uh, brigades would have existed in their, their current formats. And I think the I think the one thing at least the single service did was it was it enabled us to to pull resources and probably enabled us to protect ourselves against the kind of worst elements of. The, the fiscal background and austerity at that time. Mr. Reagan. Again, on the front line, uh, some of it has been addressed, but a lot of the main issues haven't been addressed, and that puts pressures on our members. Um, it's, it's hard to explain in, in such short terms, but you know when when people have such commitment in their own personal life, their own main time job, and they're expected to this, the broadening of the roles and transformation, it's fine broadening a role. And if it's your main occupation, that's fine. But if you have two hours a week and the road, role keeps broadening and broadening and broadening, people can't be competent. So while there has been benefits, they're able to pull resources from other areas, and special resources, that's very good. But the, the continual broadening of the role it's just not sustainable. In terms of training? Or, or yes, training. And, and just, you know, the, so initially, you know, you go back to your BA, RTA, then the role gets water rescue, line rescue, going to go to medical rescue, and the role keeps going like that. That's not sustainable in a, in a retained service where you have two hours a week to train. So while we welcome new roles, roles have to be either withdrawn or maybe put to one area or split the roles in the station. But you can't expect people to be competent in all the roles. It's just not possible. And I, and I would argue that anyone that does say that it's possible doesn't understand. OK, Mr Marshall. Okay. Um, I think in, in terms of um, the issues of uh, the people side of things and the change process and internal communications. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose as eight forces, we might still be uh, quite people centric, um, but the parochialism of that set against the risks of, over, as we've seen the threats and risks change over the last five, six years, the ability of the service to stand up and deal with those. Um, I think we would be sitting here dealing with um, different consequences of a different nature um, so it's hard to speculate on some of that. I think, um, yeah, there's lessons that, that need to be learned. Um, I think looking back, that, that's important. I think the important thing for me is that we are now one service, that we move forward. Um, having done the structural, technical elements, we need to secure the right budget um, that's sustainable. And now with a focus on um, engaging and empowering all the people that work for Police Scotland to the full of, fullness of their capability, I think things can improve and deliver all that was intended um, under the reform process, um, as opposed to sort of saying, well, what, what if something else had been, if we'd stayed the way we were? I think we would be dealing with a whole series of different questions about lack of capability, lack of capacity, lack of sustainability, lack of ability to respond to significant threats in the UK. Mr Jackson. I think just echoing the rest to hear what they're saying is, I think, uh, in terms of uh, we're in a better place, I, th I think we are. But at the same time, I think there is still lessons to be learnt and, and should have been learnt the same way, like the calm, like the business case side of things, the financial side of things. Just I think it was, if you want, a bog standard. 
But as, as, it, as we see now into year six in new services, things have developed and diverged away from the MCM with terrorism and, as I said, and specialised skills and that. Uh, even like say locations, work locations and that as well, uh, money having to be spent on, on new uh, facilities and that as well. I just think it, I think if it hadn't been for the dedication, as I said, and the loyalty of our staff, support staff, would have been a, a far worse place than what we really are. And I think it, these people just want to be valued uh, by the organisation because they're, they're the feel loyal to the, the service and proud to be part of the service. And that. So, as I said, basically overall, I think we're in a better place, but there are still lessons to be learned. There's still a long way to go yet. Cal? Uh, thanks. And again, through yourself, convener, short answer to your question is would the problems um, be there? Yes, they would be, um, arguably compounded. Thank you, convener. Um, of two supplementaries, if you keep them very brief, we can fit them in. Daniel and Liam MacArthur. I just wanted to ask Stuart Aitken a, a brief clarification. You, you, you're saying that the expansion of the role of firefighters is potentially would overstretch them. That's pretty fundamental to the transformation uh, programme and consultation that, that the fire service have set out. Are you saying that the, the addition of anti-terrorism and first responder roles is that overstretch, or is it going beyond, you know, if we're looking at additional competencies beyond those, that would be overstretched? And I'd be interested if Chris McGlone would reflect um, the, the, that. No, that I would say, just adding those two alone, is overstretching. Um, we are for it, don't, don't get me wrong, especially the medical response. That should be rolled out as soon as possible. I mean, that's only going to benefit the community. The longer that's held back, then it's only the community that's going to suffer in that. It, it, it's been long known, the, the problems with the retained service, that you know you have very limited time, people are committed to a full-time job elsewhere, they have family life. Think about it, we're asked to do the same role as a whole-time firefighter. When we turn up at an incident, we do the same thing. We have two hours a week to do all that training, to keep our skills up. The amount of paperwork we have to do now, what we call tick box exercises, the IT systems are not up to it in the station. 12 bodies, two computers. If someone takes five to 10 minutes to input, you work out for yourself. It's an hour to two hours just to input your paperwork. So what you're getting is people coming down out with their time, coming in and doing that off their own back. That's not sustainable. Okay, Mr. McGuire. Yeah, yeah I'll just expand briefly. Um, yeah, we have made a compelling argument and provided a lot of evidence for job role expansion over the, you know, the, the next few years and beyond. So it's certainly not something that um, we are opposed to, uh, exactly the opposite, but there are concerns around the capacity within the organisation to actually take on these additional roles. I, I've constantly made the case, we previously submitted evidence to this committee, that we just don't believe there is significant additional standing capacity within a firefighter's role, daily role, and within the RDS to take on all these additional very, very specialist roles that require specialist qualifications, skills and training. To put it into context, there is only roughly 300 hours within a whole time firefighter's year to train for core competence in the role. It takes approximately 222 hours to train for that that core competence in the basic role of a firefighter and approximately another 80 hours to train and maintain competence within another specialist skill. So there clearly is a difficulty uh, with moving forward and taking on these additional skills, not only within the, the whole time, but it's exacerbated, I would say, within the, the, the retained for the reasons that Stuart has, has obviously highlighted. MacArthur, very briefly. Thanks. <coughs> It's more for Mr Jackson, and I don't know if there's a question or, or just a clarification. I appreciate you've stepped in at, at short notice due to a colleague's illness. I was just listening to the, the, uh, the responses you were giving to, to Rona at Mackay's questions, and, and it didn't quite chime with what Eunice in Scotland had um, suggested in the written submission, where um, they've stated that police staff have borne the brunt of the, the process of centralisation, budget cuts, and, and what it sees, and I quote, politically driven targets that have, and again I quote, significantly compromised the ability of Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority to develop a modern and sustainable police service. Now, some of those may be legacy issues that we're working through, um, but I think it was just important for the 
committee to, to, to get that uh, on the record as it, as it was uh, set out to us in, in the written submission. I don't know if there's any observations on that, and I appreciate it would have been your colleague that, that drafted that rather than yourself. It was a, just to answer that, I was uh, <coughs> contacted by Unison Scotland, me personally on behalf of the Scottish Fire Rescue Service, Unison, and then the police staff Scotland, they would have their say as well. Both written submissions were submitted to the committee some time back. So I'm just purely commenting on SFRS and, and no police side of things. Thanks, Kevina. Um, good morning to the panel. Council, I'd like to pick up on a point that you raised in your written submission, um, where you say it is our strong view that policing and its associated structures have never been subject to the intense media scrutiny they are now, and that political opportunity has been considered ahead of allowing the structures that exist to discharge their responsibilities. Um, I'd welcome other uh, panel members' views on that point, and perhaps, Calum Steele, you could uh, expand upon the impact that has had on staff morale. Well, police officers, by their very nature, tend to be fairly resilient individuals. Uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, listening to the uh, listening to the realities of expanding roles within the fire and rescue service, it strikes me that uh, police officers undertake activities that extend to being carers, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, parking wardens, dog wardens, uh, counsellors, social workers, nurses, doctors, superman, and Wonder Woman. Um, so, you know, we, we tend to we tend to be fairly robust. But but the reality is is that you know. When uh, the new service was created, it did become something. In fact, it became something that policing never in Scotland hadn't been before. It became the totem uh, of uh, government policy, and it became totem of uh, target, uh, targeted criticism against government because of the environment that was uh, pre uh, prevailing in Scotland at that particular time. And the service was not provided the time or the space to be able to reflect the realities of working in uh, working within the, 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 the realities of the territorial landmass of Scotland rather than the artificial boundaries that uh, used to used to exist for the single for the single service so many of the difficulties or many of the what were reported very salaciously as failures or crises um, in the early days of Police Scotland, these were the kind of things that happened on a, on a I'm not going to say a routine basis, but happened periodically across the former forces. But because they were confined to local press and uh, uh, to largely local radio stations, they, they didn't get anywhere near the salacious headlines, and they certainly never got the attention in Parliament uh, the way that the single police service did. Uh, so, so I think that, that, that was the reality of, uh, of, uh, of, of that from a, from a media uh, perspective. Both, uh, both print and broadcast. Uh, in terms of, of, of um, the continual uh, effect of that, it, it created a sense of frustration amongst officers that the reporting was not reflective of the reality of the service that they were delivering. Uh, police officers were, you know, metaphorically busting their balls every single day to deliver uh, the police service that Scotland's communities were used to, and you know I've, I've heard uh, journalists uh, say it's not the, it's not their job to write uh, uh, write stories of postman delivers letters and doing your job is exactly what you're meant to do, uh, which of course was true until uh, His Royal Highness uh, was flying helicopters and the fire and, and the rescue service in Wales, uh, where postman delivers letters seemed to be an appropriate uh, headline at that point in time. But the, but in terms of the the continual downward uh, impact on um, on officers delivering service it was it didn't impact on their their day to day activities but when they encountered members of the public members of the public would say you know my experience with you has been first class my local experience has been first class but my god isn't policing in a terrible state so it created this pernicious this pernicious uh, effect across the opinions of many uh, that the service was failing uh, w and whilst no one would pretend that it didn't have its challenges the reality was that the service was functioning it could have been functioning better let's not pretend otherwise uh, but it set a public narrative that was not reflective of the reality and that was the thing that officers and staff found more difficult to deal with than anything else thank you be interested in any of the other panels thoughts on that point just briefly, um, we, we obviously sit, you know, the police and fire sit on both sides of that justice coin, and we attract um, sort of very different types of attention, I think. Um, broadly, our experience is that the media attention that we get in the Fire and Rescue Service is, is pretty positive and supportive, um, and the perception that we get on our side of the justice coin is it's exactly the opposite, you know, on the police side. 
they, they do come in for a lot of criticism, they do come in for a lot of stick, uh, and I think that must create its own you know, difficulties within the organisation with regards to staff morale, etc. Because it's difficult enough, I think, uh, as it is at the moment, uh, within both our organisations, trying to cope with the, 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 the big sort of structural changes that have taken place over the last five years without getting criticised from outside your organisations for trying to do your job. Mr Marshall? My reflection on it would be that, um, as a service, we've always um, quite rightly been scrutinised um, through lots of channels. The media um, have always been a part of that. They're the lens through which a lot of the public um, garner their views to a point. Um, and there is a real issue about reality versus perception across all of that. Uh, over the last five to six years, um, undoubtedly, the, the level of reporting on certain aspects of it has been exponentially um, of interest, I suppose, in terms of, of selling newspapers or getting um, uh, website hits or whatever it happens to be. Um, and I think there is a risk that that has provided a sort of skewed sense of what that looks like. Um, certainly, I concur with Mr Steele's um, view that um, the real experience of citizens as they engage with officers uh, and members of staff delivering a service is one that's been generally positive. Um, so that trust and confidence has always been there. It's almost the reaction, as we've experienced at first hand or through surveys um, of uh, customer satisfaction, is that the service is doing a really good job. And a lot of the stories, salacious headlines, um, were actually not reflective of what the reality was. Uh, admittedly, there were some tensions um, in terms of a, a new organisation, certain personalities, big personalities, an immature uh, police authority perhaps that still had to establish itself. All of that fed into a news cycle which um, has persisted, I think, for, for some considerable time. Um, I'm kind of hopeful now that perhaps we've moved on to more stable footing and, and there might be more fair and equitable uh, reporting around some of that, particularly if we focus on the tangible day-to-day -day delivery of what policing services look like, because there are some fantastic stories that happen day in, day out. Um, and if there was a focus on that more so than some of the um, political uh, wrangling around some aspects, then <coughs> I think the public would get a fair uh, reflection of what it's really like. Thank you. Um Picking up on, on that point, Ivor Marshall, I note in your uh, submission you highlight national access to specialist resources, the stopping of a, a duplication of support services eight times over. You know, knowledge is now shared nationally in a way that it wasn't before. Um, and obviously, Police Scotland have solved every murder since 2013, which is surely a, a good news story. So reform has had its benefits. And I'd really be interested to hear some more of the panel's views with regard to the opportunities and the benefits that reform has led to, um, challenging perhaps that negative culture that's grown up around at the same time with regard to the media. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a list of, of benefits that um, have happened as a consequence of it. Uh, you've alluded to some of them there, but uh, this the services approach to domestic violence, the services capability around about firearms, public order, the uh, services capability to deal with fraud, cyber crime, the ability to move resources around about the country, the, the ability to respond to major events, to civil emergencies, um, the list goes on and on. Um, the problem with that is that, um, Callum alluded to this, good news doesn't really sell newspapers or doesn't get hits on websites. Um, and perhaps the issue is that we all around this table um, should be advocating about the good news that happens within policing um, much more. The service certainly can step up to that. We've got a role in that. Uh, and I would say also, I suppose, to the members around the table. Um, so, yeah, there is, there's definitely something about creating a r honest, fair um, narrative about what policing um, delivers for the people of Scotland. Um, and I think that, in, I'm not speaking for Callum, in terms of his submission, I think that's the point that he was raising in his written submission. We've inadvertently moved on to um, another se session that we were just going to cover with John. But before we do, Liam, you had uh, a supplementary. Yeah, we'd, we'd heard from Callum Steele earlier that the, the Justice Secretary at the time had claimed that this was about approving uh, policing, which he's now um, said was not the case. Uh, I think it's generally accepted that a lot of the concerns that were uh, raised uh, were raised by staff and officers on the basis of concerns that they had, complaints that they had, not about making police service uh, worse, but about con um, concerns about the way in which policing was uh, delivered. Is it not a corollary if you centralise policing, therefore issues that previously would be um, aired at a local or a regional 
level, through the media, through uh, locally elected representatives, now have to be raised at a national level because the only challenge function is now at a, at a national level, given the nature of the, 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 the concerns that were being raised. Is that not, was that not inevitable as a result of creating a single structure? Well, I, don't, well I, I, I suppose in terms of that, I'll, I'll let Mr Steele respond, and, seeing as you referenced him, but uh, as part of that ongoing conversation, I think the, again, lack of maturity around about where scrutiny um, happened at first, everything became a national issue, uh, as I say, with the somewhat immature police authority being set up and, and the mechanics of how that operated and how they discharged their functions. I think, likewise, at local scrutiny board level, um, it took some time for that to maybe mature. But the relationships there have consistently, in my experience, been positive with local area commanders and divisional commanders, because those are a lot of the same people who were there in the previous legacy forces. So it just it, that happened quite quickly. So those, those conversations were still happening there, and the local news stories in, in parts all around the country generally remained positive about that type of local engagement. But I think it was trumped by a lot of that, um, some of the national um, debates that were happening around some of that. So I think in terms of scrutiny and conversation um, and how that plays out, there is a, a difference between what happens in local newspapers vis-a-vis -vis what's perhaps reported <coughs> nationally. Um, I think in terms of that uh, question of, of um, information flow and the ability um, for issues to be aired, um, Certainly, I think the nationalisation of the service made it more difficult for local voices, perhaps, either internally or from regional parts of the country, to be heard on a national level. And in fact, I remember um, from Professor Nick Fife's submissions to the, the committee, um, he alluded to the fact that sometimes that voice of localism was lost against that sort of national agenda. So it is, an, I think, an unintended consequence, perhaps, of that centralisation. And as I spoke about, that focus on um, structural and technical um, perhaps at the expense of the relationships and the, the human interface that we had, um, perhaps under eight forces. Again, I would say, thankfully, it seems to be sort of we've, we've recognised that, or the service has recognised that, and, and made moves to actually repair a lot of that damage that was done. Um, then can I ask all the witnesses, we have five and we want to make sure you all get a decent um, hearing today in, in a limited time. Could you be as succinct as possible with your answers and could members be as succinct as possible with their supplementaries and questions? Callum. Thank you, uh, in, in, in direct response to the question, was it inevitable? I don't think it was inevitable. And in some ways, I'm kind of taken back in time to, I think, an evidence session that we had in this, probably in this very room, uh, about four or five years ago, when uh, representatives from COSLA and others were talking about the, the, the local scrutiny arrangements that were going to take place at that period in time. Uh, I think it's worth um, reminding ourselves that the previous scrutiny arrangements were not legislated. You know, the arrangements for police boards developed orga organically uh, across local authorities, whilst they ended up be being largely mirrors of themselves. Uh, they, were, they were not things that were legislated for centrally to, uh, to determine how local scrutiny arrangements take place. And it was certainly my expectation, uh, naively as it turned out, uh, and it would appear to be, have been the certainly Parliament's intention, uh, that there was no requirement to legislate for local scrutiny and that they had demonstrated in the early 1970s that they were capable of putting their own house in order and putting things in place. But the reality was that when the new single service was created is that to a large part many of the former local authorities that had involvement in scrutiny effectively gave up. Um, much of the pathway projects that were developed on the run-up to the creation of the single service were abandoned or allowed to wither on the vine. Uh, local scrutiny became something of a, uh, of an inconvenience to routine council business uh, and what was once a, a dedicated uh, committee of a, of a local authority or local authorities working together in, in terms of joint police boards or uh, unitary authorities became 20 minutes at the end of some other meeting. Uh, so, no, I don't believe it was inevitable. And I also don't believe it's a responsibility of the police service to fix this. Um, I, and as I've said in the written submission, there is probably something to be done between Scottish Police Authority and local authorities about improving, even now improving, the relationship that has, to that has to exist to make sure that local scrutiny exists. But it's definitely not something for the police service. We had no role for it in the early 1970s. We've got no responsibility for it here, because if we direct local communities as to how they should be scrutinising, you can understand the whole host of difficulties that that, and, and headlines that that would create thereafter. We've moved on to your area of questioning a bit, Liam, so do you want to just continue with that? Yeah, please? I mean, the, I think both Mr Marshall and, and Mr Steele have, have 
touched on um, issues of concern about a loss of, of localism at the time um, of, of centralisation. I'd be interested in, in your views now about the, the, the extent to which communities can hold policing to account. I mean, I take your point, Mr Steele, about where that responsibility ought to, to lie. Um, but it would seem from what you were suggesting that um, actually this is at the gift of um, local authorities to, to resolve. And if that's the case, uh, are there, there, there suggestions about how they might go about doing that? Or, or, or are we in the territory here of, 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 uh, uh, of directing local authorities to to act in particular ways, because certainly the concern is, is raised that their, their, their access, not necessarily to the area commander, but those within um, SPA and those higher up within Police Scotland, where decisions are taken, where, where budget decisions are taken, etc., is not as good as it, it, it might be, and that therefore what they are dealing with is the consequences of those decisions that are taken somewhere else within Police Scotland or somewhere else within the SPA. So how can that be? How can that be rectified? Okay, well, I'll go first, Convener. Um, yeah, I think as far as the extent to which uh, local communities can hold police to account, uh, that has taken some time to mature. As I said earlier, I think there are good, good relationships between uh, local elected members and local area commanders, chief inspectors, superintendents, chief superintendents, divisional commanders. As far as influencing um, what local policing services look like, uh, obviously the local scrutiny boards have, uh, subject to Callum's comments earlier, I have started to mature um, the development of local outcome improvement plans and locality plans, write that down in some ways. Um, I suppose my uh, frustration around some of that, and I say this as a former commander of a, of a division, is that um, sometimes you do not have the autonomy in terms of budget to be able to commit to joint working as per Christie principles, collaborations, because of the centralist control of budgets within the service driven by the, the cuts. So they get sucked into the centre. And also a, a frustration on, on the part of uh, local commanders that at times um, the desire to deliver those gold standard specialist national resources and services um, and inevitably has a drain on sort of local services at, at, uh, at that end. So I think um, there are frustrations around about that and that ability to influence from communities. Absolutely, I think the, the local police managers uh, who are there are cognizant of the views and do their best to deliver initiatives and plans and day-to-day -day services that respond to the local needs. I think their frustrations would be that they don't necessarily have that full uh, autonomy and full commitment of resources to be able to work on a partnership basis. Legislation that set up a structure of scrutiny, as Callum Steele rightly suggested, that wasn't there previously, but that it is overseeing um, a smaller area of responsibility because of um, the way in which decisions are now taken within uh, a centralised force. And, and again, I'd be interested on the fire and rescue um, uh, side of things as well, in terms of the, the area of discretion for, for local uh, for, for local chiefs as well. But is that would that be a, a fair characterisation? I think it's a, it's a fundamental consequence of, and I'll keep it brief, fundamental consequence that at times you're, you're balancing between um, strategic decisions about national issues, and that might be about um, capability around about firearms and as a consequence of threats and so on and so forth on a national level, and you're balancing that against putting enough resources to deal with the day-to-day -day routine policing matters, and it's always a balancing act around some of that. And, the, and, and as I say, at times it, it has felt, certainly over the last piece, that there has been more of a focus on setting up those national structures and making sure those are um, really robust, and um, perhaps at the cost sometimes of the local resources. Because inevitably, if you have to take officers away to do a historic sex abuse case, fundamentally, those will always create um, vacancies on the uh, operational uniform front line. I'm going to bring in Mr. McGloom, but... I'm mindful of the, the fact that you've asked your question in two parts, and the, you know, the second part is obviously how do we improve it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not naive enough to believe that, regardless of the desire as to what should have taken place, that it didn't take place. Uh, so, therefore, the question as to how we fix it is, 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 a, is a pertinent one. To me, this, this comes down to how we make sure that local authorities effectively are, and locally elected members are seen to have some kind of skin in the game. 
Um, you know, given the change to the funding arrangements where no, uh, you know, effectively half the money doesn't come from local authorities anymore, uh, the influence over finance is something that uh, no, you know, lo no longer exists in a direct level. But of course, financial decisions have a direct impact on policing that's delivered in local communities. Uh, now, whether that Will that can distill down to the number of officers and staff that are available, the type of the, the type and number of buildings that they work from. Um, but I, I do think, and I'm, I suspect that it, it will be uh, it, it will be front and centre in any uh, Liberal Democrat library that the, the the speech of the chair of the Scottish Police Federation that was given at our conference last year did contain some suggestions as to what could be done to improve it. Uh, and uh, whilst you know, whilst I believe that the, the the general principle of the Scottish Police Authority is fundamentally sound. I do believe that it could be improved to the point where COSLA, as the you know, umbrella body for local authority, should be able to identify people for appointing to the Scottish Police Authority. Um, you know, that's, I, I think that would uh, enhance the Scottish Police Authority and it would absolutely bring direct buy-in to local authorities then uh, to recognise that they do have skin in the game because they are there seeing uh, and able to influence at the very centre of the, the governance body uh, financial decisions that are going to impact on communities the length and breadth of Scotland. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Speaking as uh, somebody who's obviously worked for a long time within the organisation and, and, and as the head of the Fire Brigade Union, I think the I think both the the Fire Scotland Act uh, and the structure of the organisation is conducive to, to good local uh, devolved decision making and relationships with the local community as well. I think things like the the Community Empowerment Empowerment Act. You know, hands a, a significant degree of autonomy to, to those local communities to engage with their local fire and rescue service. And there is a, cre a clear pathway up to the local senior officer who, for all intents and purposes, is the accountable officer within that you know, local area. Whether or not those the decisions and the decision-making autonomy that that local senior officer has is fully supported by devolved budgets from within the fire and rescue service, I think is, is, is probably something I can't answer and something I'm sure the, the chief officer could answer for you. Okay, supplementary, John, very briefly. Yes, thank you. I, I want to ask uh, Mr Marshall, Mr Steele, about um, what might be seen as a misunderstanding there, namely that the, this Police and Fire Reform Act introduced centralised services which weren't there previously. In advance of Police Scotland, there were centralised services where there are the Scottish Drug Enforcement Agency, Police officers will be aware of this, I'm sure. The training, the recruitment, some specialist services, for which there was no local input. Is it not the case that there's more uh, scrutiny of these bodies now, and in any case, the former uh, police boards had no one of a sufficient level of clearance that could scrutinise issues like counter-terrorism, and that isn't the case anymore either. So there is actually better scrutiny of these elements, important elements and significant resource. Would I be right? Uh, on taking my steer from the convener, short answers, yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, better scrutiny and better line of sight. And an opportunity, I think, now for bidding of those type of resources and other specialist resources to be able to be deployed um, around the whole of Scotland as opposed to perhaps uh, in a more parochial way as they were before. Okay. Shona, followed by John and Fulton. Um, good morning, panel. A lot of the area of questioning I was going to ask has already been answered, but maybe just focus on one aspect, and that is the next phase of delivering that coherence and consistent approach. We've talked about the improvements made in uh, specialist services. We've talked about some of the improvements made in, in terms of scrutiny and delivery of services uh, and structure. Where is the next phase of, of improving that consistency. So, for example, one area that springs to mind is, is around um, IT infrastructure, for example. You know, what, what next for that ma maturing organisations in terms of improving that and, and, cons and delivering further on that consistency? Because, uh, and where, where are those gaps still existing? Would you like to take that, Kelly? Uh, and, uh, I think where next has to be a return to first principles. Um, it, it's all very well talking about national and specialist services, uh, but to a large extent these have been delivered to the detriment of local services uh, or services that would traditionally have been considered to be local policing uh, uh, activities. Now, uh, that's not to take away from the realities of uh, 
you know, that, that we need to invest uh, exponentially uh, in our IT infrastructure. Uh, we need to invest uh, considerable sums of money in our estate. Um, but the reality is, is that local policing has <coughs> suffered, uh, response policing has suffered. Yes, the type of policing has changed, but policing has always changed. Uh, whereas once upon a time, police officers would deal with volume in terms of uh, call after call after call, we're now dealing with complexity, which takes time uh, in a way that uh, police officers largely didn't have to do in the not too distant past. Uh, and the continual taking away of people from those kind of roles, which is in itself probably the most special area of policing that deals with all manners of complexity uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Uh, the taking away of individuals for that to put people in, uh, in siloed roles where they have a very clear defined area of responsibility, be that the investigation of serious and organized crime, be that in, in, the, in the investigation of historic sex abuse, be that in the uh, investigation of fraud, uh, Supporting these services is hugely, hugely important, and undoubtedly the service is much more adept at that than it ever was in the past. But the price of that has been local policing. Uh, the price of that has been human. Uh, we have uh, police officers in all areas of the service working ridiculously long hours. We have stripped out ranks and supervision, which introduces its own risks. Uh, and undoubtedly these will turn out to be realised in years to come when problems of lack of supervision uh, will will show what lack of supervision has always shown, that eventually you get to a point of critical mass and you end up being criticised for it. So there actually needs to be a return to first principles and stop talking about the, the big and just look at the practicalities of the here and now. How, how do you, and where's the balance between um, making sure that that local policing is delivered in a consistent way across Scotland with the ability for local responsiveness? Where, where does that lie so that you've got a, a consistent quality wherever you're delivering policing across Scotland, but with the ability for local decision making? How, how, do, you, how do you balance that? I th I th again, through yourself, Camina, I think, in, I think in truth you're never going to get consistency in an absolute sense, in much the same way as you don't get uh, access to a heart surgeon if you live in Barra. Uh, the, the reality is, is that policing will be tailored depending, uh, you know, dependent on, the, first of all, the resources that are available to deliver it and also the needs of the community that are there. Of course, when something big happens, and this is, this is, this is what I think is important, when something big happens, the consistency of that, of that service is, is pretty much guaranteed because large numbers of officers are picked up, uh, they're flown in or ferried in or driven in, uh, they deal with the issue and then they go away. Uh, but that in its own right ignores the realities of the importance of community relationships. Uh, it ignores the realities of the fact that uh, police officers have to continue to deliver service after these individuals have gone. And it also ignores the reality that perhaps had police resources been there in the first instance, there might have been more of a preventative impact uh, to, uh, to prevent the big thing happening in the first place. And to some extent, that comes back to the priorities that are set by Parliament. If Parliament thinks it's important that we concentrate on historic child sex abuse uh, and terrorism to the detriment of local policing, then Parliament can make that clear in how much money it gives it. The police service just now does not have the funding to pay for all of the police officers that it currently has. That is a direct thing that goes right back to Parliament. If you don't want to fund the police officers that you have in our communities, then don't give us the budget for it. It's very simple. Mr. Marshall? Yeah. Try and be brief. In response to the uh, question, I, I agree with Callan. I think there's a, a bit to sort of revisit first principles. What is demand look like now um, and projecting forward? The real demand, the perceived demand, the failure demand that the service has to cope with, um, and what is the sustainable operating model that can deliver that? Um, so how do we know they've got the right resources in the right place, rightly equipped to deal with, with that demand? You mentioned IT. That's an enabler. Um, it can help people who are uh, doing their job to do it maybe more effectively and more productively. But that's not the panacea. It's not the answer to all the ills around about the demand that we face. Um, I personally believe in terms of what are the next steps. There needs to be that. I've mentioned the um, back to valuing our people a bit more and a demonstration of that in terms of um, proper investment in professional development conversations, pro proper investment in terms of the training and development. Uh, and empowerment, and that feeds into organisational culture and how that's developed through the style of leadership that needs to happen go forward to create that learning organisation. Um, and as a consequence of that, that's the answer to your second question about how you balance consistency with quality. 
um, you rely on the people who are there dealing with it at that time. They, they can provide the consistent um, approach, which is the framework within the, the service operates, but tailored to whatever that local um, context is. Thank you, convener. I think the next phase uh, is a very risky phase. Um, I think we are both trying to consolidate you know, what we've got at the moment, what we've inherited from the previous eight, eight services, and, 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 and we're also trying to meet the aspirations of both the government and the service with regards to uh, expansion and transformation. I think one of the ways that, that we've, uh, we think that can be done, or we've you know, continually made the case for, is some kind of national standards because we think it's one of the areas that we've, we've, we've kind of gone backwards in the fire and rescue service. We, we lost uh, response and attendance times, so we have no way of measuring that, for example. We lost section 19 of the 47 Act, which, which dealt with establishment levels of the organisation, so changes to establishment had to go back to the Scottish Secretary, for example, for permission. Uh, we lost the Joint Council for Design and Development, which ensured consistency in standards and equipment uh, and appliances, which obviously then fed into uh, delivery. We, we moved from you know, ranks to, to roles, lost kind of layers of uh, uh, management within the, the, the structure of the organisation, which I don't think has been particularly broadly helpful. But I think uh, there has to be a, prob a, a proper method of audit and assessment against you know, meaning meaningful uh, performance indicators. Because the service, you know, do, for example, make broad sweeping statements about we always have the, the right resources in the right place at the right time. Well, I've no idea how you how you you can make that statement if you have no meaningful method or way of actually measuring that. And I think if you had response standards, for example, if you have response times, you 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 would be able to do that because the evidence shows that it isn't true all the time. And I think the recent evidence in Aberdeen, for example, where Clearly, if, you, if you're taking the same mantra over 300 times within a 10-month period, clearly the service did not have the right you know, resources in the right place at the right time. I'm mistaken, or Mr Jackson, who haven't commented on the next phase, have any comments they'd want to, to make? I would just like to echo really what you said there and add that there really needs to be a coherent plan and a credible plan going forward to address the retained service and the recruitment and retention, that has to be at the front of any plan going forward. It's a valuable resource and highly motivated people and people who really care about their community, but they're just, they're just overworked and uh, underfunded, I guess. OK, thank you okay. for that. And Mr Jackson? I much to say, Mayor. <clears throat> just the fact that overstretched uh, due to, as I said, the strategic side of things as well, where the... Uh, there's been closures of previous buildings, workplaces, and that people ha have had to move. There's already, <coughs> excuse me, within the last uh, couple of years, there has been restructuring going on within certain directorates, departments, just to try and make sure it, it is focused and going forward. Uh, me personally, I would just like unions to be more involved in the restructuring and, and get uh, an insight to what's happening and even our opinion on things and that as well. Uh, as I said, even like recruitment, retain, mint the staff, and that is key as well. Uh, there's, there's specific key jobs where we kind of struggle, we always kind of struggle. And as I say, a lot of people were in here and have stayed in here on a lesser salary just simply because of the value, the, the role that they play, and they're proud to be part of that service. Uh, so, as I said, that's the same again. We would like our staff valued. Uh, but the service does have core values. I'd like them to kind of stick to them and honour them. And that, that would, as I say, encourage staff to keep going and, and stay here. John then, Fulton. Um, thank you, Kavina. It's, it's a question for Mr McClone. Mr McClone, in your submission, you talk about there being a, an insufficiency of knowledge, operational knowledge, within the fire service board for which, you know, for them to, to do the necessary scrutiny. And you suggest that perhaps what's the phrase, uh, independent objective advice be provided. I, I wonder, just with linkage, scrutiny is clearly important, but was it not ever thus? And I wonder, in response, if you can say, do you see a, an enhanced role for the inspectorate in providing that independent? I think the inspectorate has been extremely helpful. 
I think some of the reporting from the inspectorate, you know, over the, the first five years has been very useful. Uh, we've had very positive and useful and uh, productive dialogue with the inspectorate when they've been carried out their inspections, especially, you know, the local area inspections. And I, I think that uh, I, I think they're a very good critical friend to the organisation as well. I know it might not look like that sometimes, but uh, they, they were recently in the city of Glasgow, for example, and, and it highlighted the fact that, you know, despite a lot of good work, there are still are some issues with, you know, the age and availability of appliances. Appliances being off the run, some of the you know the PPE, etc. So I think this, I think the service do need uh, that critical inspect, inspector at role, and I, and, I, and I think it's it's quite clear that that role is performed by uh, by and large, and certainly in, in, in my 30 years, an ex chief chief officer, because I think that that individual brings uh, a, a vast degree of wealth of knowledge and experience within that operational environment, and therefore that informs the. You know the, the the product that ultimately comes out of the inspectorate. We feel that the board could do, you know, with some kind of similar input from, you know, an operational head as well. Uh, Jimmy Campbell, one of the previous ex chiefs of Lothian and Borders, fairly recently left the board, wasn't replaced by somebody with, you know, equivalent knowledge, for example. And we think the the board in the scrutiny role, especially within the operational environment, which, let's face it, is, the, I think, the most important environment for the Fire and Rescue Service, is weaker as a result of not having that operational head on the board. So, you know, we feel that the, it's something that the, the, the Scottish Government is supportive of, i.e. some kind of employee representation on public boards. I think it's something that is lacking uh, on the, the, the Fire and Rescue Board now. Uh, I think there are examples where the, the chief is obviously speaking in, in operational matters. I think fairly recently there was a, a discussion around the service's ability to respond to a Grenfell-type incident, for example, and I think the chief made reference to operational discretion. I don't think there's anybody sitting on that board that would have any idea or clue what, in today's terms, in a, in a, in a dynamic, risky, hazardous environment, what operational discretion means in relation to, to, to dealing with a, a, an incident. OK, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Fulton. <coughs> Thanks, Camila. <coughs> and good morning, panel. Um, it's picking up, actually, from the, the last line of questioning there and something that uh, Derek Jackson had mentioned a couple of times we spoke about um, individual firefighters and police officers and other members of staff being able to to impact positively on, on uh, decisions at a strategic level. Do you think that this happens, and, and how does it happen, and at what level, and it, it, what can be done to, to improve it further, perhaps picking up from Chris McGlone's previous point? Basically, <clears throat> strategically, we, we did have an involvement, uh, as in like the executive board, but it's, it's the long there's a lot more to it than just being part of it. It's like having your, although you're getting your say, is it actually getting listened to? And is it actually getting acted upon? That, that's the difference. And that's where, like say, we've, we've recently, uh, we're going through, it's a, a soft FM thing here, and it's uh, where 95 jobs are, are going to be a loss to our service. Right for day one, we, we condemned that and say that we, it goes right against uh, privatisation, uh, the public pay sector, and that it's 95 jobs we will never ever <coughs> get back in the service. But we, we were able to go, we still go to the board meetings and that, but it's an indication of, it's like we get involved, but as anything, as our, our opinions have been taken on board, that decision was kind of made before we even went along. And strategically, it's, it's kind of as I said, we've, we've had a seat at the table, uh, even like the New Bridge training project board, the New West Arc uh, training project. We do get seats on that, and we do get a say, but uh, as I said, the, the biggest thing for us is, uh, is it actually our say being listened to and acted upon. What do you think could be done to uh, demonstrate, if you like, that, 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 that your views and, are, and concerns have been heard and have been acted on? How could that be fed back to you? Well, even back, as I said, that was last year, the, the regards the Soft FM uh, project, we'd, we'd right for day one, as I said, do our regional organisers, 
uh, on behalf of support staff, trade unions, uh, Unis and Unite, both even written a letter to the board saying that we were dead against it. The board approved it, uh, and that was pretty much it. That's, it's been approved. That's it. Uh, we, we then wrote a, a letter, again, a joint letter, to the then uh, Minister for Fire, Annabel Yoon, requested a meeting, and the same again, say that these, these 95 roles, I mean, it, it's more prominent now that more uh, contracts are becoming back in-house as opposed to going out because it's been proven that it have never worked in the first place. And that's we were kind of highlighting that as well, the fact that the same again, we, we even like to go back to Annabel Yoon, we never got that opportunity to sit down and explain and put our point across. It was a case that because the board had approved it, that's the decisions being made. So, as I said, we, we do get a chance to say, but a lot of times the decisions have already been made, and, and that's it. Has anybody else <coughs> want to come on that? Yeah, I'd just like to follow up on that. Very much along the same lines, often our views are canvassed. Lost count many times over the years, people come out and recognise there's a problem with recruitment, retention. We need to look at that, go away two or three years later, another visit at the station, we've got problems, they go away, and nothing's ever done. And we get no feedback on the visits either. Um, so it, it leaves you feeling isolated, it leaves the, the members feeling so their opinions are not valued. And like I say, for 20 years, that's been the case. The, the problem has been recognised, but no credible plan or alternative has ever been proposed or put forward or trialled. Miguelon, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Our, uh, we do have, a, I think, a, a pretty good, strong voice within the organisation, and, and it's recognised by the service, and it's reflected in, I think, the actions and the decisions that are made as well. We've, we've got... You know, various methods and uh, forums w within which we can we can voice, raise concerns, and, and and have input. We've got an employee partnership forum, partnership advisory a group that we can go for dispute resolution. For example, we do have a working together framework that's based upon our own kind of um, good industrial relations protocols within our, uh, our our own terms and conditions. Um, so, so I think our voice, certainly from the FBU's point of view, uh, is well heard. Uh, I, and, you know, I, I, I'm certainly in regular contact, uh, as is my Scottish Regional Secretary with the Chief Officer, uh, the, the, the Deputy Chief Officer and, and officers within the, the organisation as well. The only thing I would say is that uh, I would encourage perhaps the service to invite us along to the subcommittees that are bored a wee bit more often. There are uh, four or five sub subcommittees that, that sit and deal with more, more of the, uh, the board work than is dealt with on table at the public meetings. And I think there's a, we, we, we haven't really attended those uh, subcommittees uh, too, too often over the last few years. OK, and Mr Marshall. Uh, I think the, uh, there is a body of evidence uh, from research from Scottish Institute of uh, Policing Research, Nick Fife, from our own uh, internal staff surveys that would tend to indicate over um, the lifespan of Police Scotland over the last five years or so that perhaps internal communications has not been um, what it should have been, certainly not a two-way process. Um, uh, quite often there's, there was a lot of what and how being pushed out, but no engagement in terms of why um, certain decisions were taken, and certainly not in terms of any strategic decisions. Um, again, I would say that there's, there probably was a bit of a... It's a, down to leadership, it's down to style of leadership and the organisational culture. Perhaps there, was, perhaps there was a degree of fear and compliance as far as just do as you're told, as opposed to um, offering a view. I'd like to think that um, things have changed somewhat round about that. Again, with the maturity, I think the, the new members in the Scottish Police Authority are much more open um, to conversation and, and being engaged in force executive. Certainly, the members that I speak with regularly are very open to that. The key challenge is about making that throughout the whole organisation. I think we've all got responsibility um, to engender that culture of um, in ensuring that everyone's voice is listened to, that innovation is, is valued throughout the organisation. Not all the brains are at the top of the organisation. There are some really good ideas at, at, at all levels, and those need to be embraced. Um, and there needs to be a translation from um, things that people say through staff surveys or through representatives like myself or Mr Steele, that that's actually listened to and that there's seen to be some kind of tangible cognizance of that. And perhaps even at times at strategic direction, a change of direction on a decision. Um, that Feeding that back 
um, would encourage people to say, do you know what, my voice has got some kind of uh, uh, impact and that uh, I will be listened to, not simply in terms of to be patted on the head, but actually my view is of value. So I think all of that together, um, I think there's still something to do about the, the creating that learning uh, organisational culture. Um, and as I say myself, and uh, I know from association and from um, other uh, staff associations, we do have forums to speak at, uh, and we certainly take that um, as far as we possibly can. Okay, John, if you're very brief, because we are running behind. It, it is. Uh, thank you, Kamina. Uh, Mr. Reekin, I, I sense your frustrations. I, I wonder if you're selling yourself a bit short in regard to one thing, and that is I represent the Highlands and Islands, and for your representations that have been made in respect of training in island areas have been responded to with very significant investment in facilities in the northern and western Isles. I wonder if you'd recognise that and maybe take some credit for that. Well, well I, I, okay, for, so first of all, our, our organisation, I think we submitted an evidence about, um, you know, we're not really recognised. We've asked for a post similar to the FBU, one post so we can have someone full time to deal with it. Any communications that come out during just now, like harmonisation and, and uh, standardisation, the last email that came out from the fire service, it's always a joint statement, fire service and FBU. We're never mentioned in these statements. And Tristan, who's been part of these negotiations, doesn't even get that update. It's like we don't exist. The, the email that came out this week... Exists, Mr Aitken. Pardon? These excellent training facilities in Orkney and the Western Isles do exist. Well, well I can't comment on them because I'm not part of them. What I can say is in our area is that we have 50% of the training staff we should have for the stations in our local area. There should be four training staff, there is two. One is temporary. There is no plan to sort that for at least six months. You're here to th speak on behalf of the, the whole no, organisation. No, no, sorry. Leave it there then. Okay, thank okay. you. That, that's been cleared up. Uh, before we leave this kind of area, can I ask about the formal complaints um, process and any comments on that? You, you've said views aren't listened to. Um, I think in particular, Mr Unison's um, uh, submission focused on that. Could you ask just generally around the panel if the process is working well in, in your view? I, I don't want to be in a position where I'm asking questions of the chair, but I, c complaints is a very wide yeah, subject. I suppose I'm looking more formal complaints because it's unclear if we're talking about co formal complaints have been brushed aside or just views that um, are expressing concern. Uh, it was really to do with the unison. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, where they. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, you're in at the last minute and here we are asking you more questions about it. Um, in our view, the, uh, it is our view that the challenges and criticisms of their service have been stifled and there are limited pa pathways to pursue complaints and concerns about the operation of the service for police staff. Now, is that just a form of wording and have you really expressed today what the issue was, do you think, Mr Jackson? As I said, I'm, I'm here on kind of behalf of SFRS. Yeah. Uh, the, the representative <coughs> should have been here was from okay. Police Scotland, so she would have been able to... understand that. What we'll do is we'll clarify yeah, that with the person the that, that wrote it. That's us. fine. Yeah. Right, moving on. Daniel. So, so some of what I was wanting to talk about uh, has been covered off by, by Shona, but um, can I begin by asking Callum Steele what his understanding of the phrase capacity creation means and whether or not he thinks it's a useful one. Uh, from telling you exactly what I think it means. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably the smoke that accompanies the mirror that then feeds the spin about how uh, the police service has got a, a tremendous amount of ability to do an awful lot more with a damn sight for your people. Uh, like I said a few moments ago, the police service at this point in time does not have the budget to pay for the officers that it has got. Anything that talks about capacity creation is, is, a, is a ruse for cuts. There you go. Thank you. And the reason I led off with that, I mean, I think uh, policing 2026 is an incredibly important bit of work. But I think some of my concerns is that it has focused on where you might be able to reduce numbers, and, and in particular, um, I think some of the, the elements of that have potentially been looking at that, that, that local level. And just given what both yourself and, and Ivor Marshall have been saying, do you think there's a need to refocus uh, that effort in terms of the strategic work about the balance of the police force on that balance between the local divisions 
and what both of you have described as sort of gold-plated uh, national units and resource. I, I, I wouldn't say refocus. I think it's got to be done in, in conjunction with what's currently taking place. That, that you know, the reality is, is that anything that uh, anything that talks about capacity has to recognise that we're currently delivering a police service just now which struggles to meet all of the demand that is placed upon it. So anything in terms of capacity would pro arguably provide the ability to respond to more of what's being done. But large numbers of our, uh, in fact, large numbers of the police service full stop. Uh, don't get a break during the course of their working day, don't get a break during the course of their working week, largely suffer tremendous disruption to their rest periods, largely work far beyond the, the, the maximum working week in any event. And that situation gets worse, and I'm sure Ivor will speak from, from his own member's perspective, uh, the further up uh, the rank structure you go when overtime tends not to be payable. Uh, so, it's it's definitely something that's got to be got to be recognised, and uh, you know if if I may steal a part of your question to to respond to uh, that that was asked previously about engagement, uh, the way in which you engage your workforce is you provide them the time to be able to be consulted with and to deliver that to be engaged, uh, but if from the moment they come in until the moment they leave they are run ragged and they can't catch a breath, can't get in for a pee, uh, never mind never mind a sandwich or a, or a, or a cup of tea or coffee, uh, then you, know, you, you, you look at the complexity of the problems that uh, just sheer demand creates. So it, I, don't think it's, I don't think it should be done instead of the national uh, priorities, which continue to be important. I think it should be done as well as. Do you think there's sufficient focus on that in the pleasing 2026 uh, plans as they exist at the moment? Uh, I, I, I think that, uh, well, I've got my own view on the plan in terms of the, the, the 2026 document. I think it's, it's, it's like many of these strategic documents. It's so wide and woolly that you can take it in any particular direction you want, which tends to be the purpose of them, if I'm being honest. Uh, but the, uh, you know, wh whether there is enough attention paid to uh, you know, policing and policing response. I, I'm not entirely sure that there is. There's, there's, a, there's a whole load of aspirational uh, beliefs and philosophies around about other services stepping up and delivering their part, their end of the bargain. Uh, but I'm not seeing any evidence that that's going to uh, that's going to take place. Uh, I mean, the reason that we are, and as you know, I mentioned a few moments ago, the reason we are psychologists, counsellors, social workers is because other services are stepping away, uh, and. The reason that the police exist is because, you know, for a whole variety of reasons, is we are the act of our service for every other service, and it's about time people started to recognise that and put the money in to, to, to make sure that we're able to deliver it. Uh, because if we're not there to pick up the pieces when, for example, social work aren't able to pick up the pieces, then you've just left with pieces. So, if I, rather than duplicating those questions, uh, I'd just like to ask Ivor Marshall. I mean, is it correct to say at the moment that we actually have? very different levels of policing between local policing divisions and, and that those levels are in some ways a, a legacy of, of policing patterns before the, the police service and, and to what extent is that, does that hangover feed into this issue in terms of the, the, the availability of sufficient resource at, at local levels? I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the staffing profile in the territorial um, divisions varies and that is largely based on what was um, there previously. Um, but that, driven by the, the resources and the demands that were, were there, um, I think it's, a, it's not a question necessarily that, that um, in terms of balancing that out, I think it's looking at that bigger picture. And as you sort of alluded to, I don't think it's as binary as specialist versus local. I think we need to step, take a step back before that and ask the question zero about where is the real demand perceived demand, the failure demand, right across the organisation um, and understand what that looks like in terms of the, <coughs> the type and number of resources that it takes to meet that demand so that we do get that balance between national specialist resources and a robust, capable, competent front uh, service delivery, which, as Callum has alluded to, is overstretched at this point in time. So we need to ask that fundamental question design a sustainable operating model and get the appropriate resources put into that. Added to that might be looking at what is that distribution in terms of local policing and seeing where that is. And if there's any disparity in terms of the ability of local divisions to be able to respond to those things. But it has to be a multi-layered situation because 
Um, there's local policing, but there are aspects of regional and national and even international policing which impacts on local communities. So we have to look at it, look at it in a sort of three-dimensional map and understand that. So, so the phrase that ASPs have used with me in direct communication is that there's a need for a demand-led review. Is that that's something that you'd repeat here? And, and what does that demand-led review look like? Yeah, um, and as I say, that's that question zero. We'll go back and ask, what is the demand? And demand has changed and can, will continue to change, and we need to project that forward. I think the service has uh, certainly listened to that. There's a project under the 2026 work streams that, that you refer to. Um, I suppose my reservation with some of that is, and it's uh, back to the, the point that was maybe uh, raised earlier about sort of sometimes the professional services-led approach rather than a sort of policing-led approach is it can get wrapped up in a lot of um, project management language. We need to understand what that looks like, and there's a lot of professional judgment around it. We have a lot of data, and we need to make um, some informed decisions around about that rather than waiting three or four years for a fancy project with lots of detailed analysis, perhaps. So the service has listened to that and are, I think, as far as I understand, are expediting that sense of understanding demand and then looking at that. So, so just a final question. I mean, just on that point in terms of fancy projects... I think Mr McGlynn wanted to get in. Is this on the same point you're, you're continuing with, um, Daniel? Yeah, it just relates directly okay. to what, what's just in, been David. said. Um, the, the, uh, to what extent is there a sort of when there is something that needs to be done, a sort of a, a specialist unit or project gets created at the centre, and to what extent actually could things be done or led by local divisions rather than being kind of specialist resource created at the centre? Is that, are ideas like that uh, something that need to be explored? I think there are, uh, there are mechanisms in terms of strategic, tactical and operational decision-making, tasking boards, uh, again, across those three levels, that would enable uh, decisions to be taken about which part of the organisation might take primacy or take lead. But as I say, the, the interconnectedness of, of elements of a particular issue would be such that, that all elements across specialist and local will have a part to play. Um, so there are mechanisms to deal with that. And as I say, it's always a balance to be struck. And it, it's not a binary, you know, um, local uh, officers dealing with things and, and specialists. Um, these two things are conjoined. The important thing is about have we got the balance around that sometimes. And I think that's where it needs to be um, looked at. Mr McLuhan. Thanks, Convener. It's just a very quick point on the, the capacity issue. It's, uh, it's an argument that um, frustrates me, annoys me continually. We've, we've, we've challenged it previously because I think it's a weak argument and it's, it's one where the service are saying we are wanting to expand into these areas and do these things because we've got lots of spare time. We, we, we simply don't have lots of spare time and we've, we've, it's been based on a single, a single argument that there's been a significant reduction in fires over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Nobody's challenging that. Everybody knows what that percentage drop in fires is. The argument should be that the Fire and Rescue Service are expanding into these roles and are able to take on some of these additional roles, for example, emergency medical response, out of hospital cardiac arrest, formal arrangements for responding in a multi-agency environment to a terrorist type incident because they're the right organisation to do it and firefighters are the right professionals to take on those additional roles given obviously the, the, the right pay terms and conditions, the training and, and PPE etc and we do welcome the, the government's additional investment recently in the budget to help us support move into those areas. <coughs> In terms of specialist support, Calum, I could just ask you perhaps um, if you think the right balance has been achieved there for more equal access, just specifically on that point briefly. Uh, that, you know, that, that, I think that's probably one of the most difficult questions because the, you know, the, 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 the amount of resource that you require depends on the incident that you're dealing with. Um, I think what's probably fair to say is that because of, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't, you've got to look at specialists as a, as a multidisciplinary area in any event. It can be, uh, it can be firearms, it can be public order, it can be, you know, major investigation teams. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 is the balance right? Well, what I can say is that those departments, by and large, not exclusively, but by and large, have been staffed to gold standard. Um, would you want to diminish that? I would say that the answer would probably be no. Uh, but if the cost of maintaining that gold standard is a uh, copper standard elsewhere, no pun intended, uh, then perhaps uh, there is a need for some 
uh, you know, rebalancing of what's there. But the consequence of that will be that we will not be doing as well what we currently do in some areas. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Liam Kerr. Convener, just going back directly to the Act, the final policy intent was to strengthen the connection between the services and communities, uh, to involve many more local councillors and better integrate with the community planning partnerships. Do you believe that centralisation has helped or hindered in that intention? Certainly my experience in the fire service, I, th I think it's helped that. Um, without repeating what I said earlier, there is a, there's a good line of communication uh, for local communities and other uh, partner agencies within local senior officer areas. And those local senior officers are, are held to account scrutiny by their local scrutiny boards. So everything that they, they do is held under scrutiny and, it, and, it, and it's open to scrutiny by members of the public in the, the communities as well. So I think, the, you know, I think that element of the act um, uh, has worked. I think probably those other partner agencies are the, the people best uh, placed to judge whether or not that engagement from the Fire and Rescue Service has been you know, improved or has been positive. I think there is definite room for expansion within that area as well. And I touched on some of those areas by talking about you know, an, an expansion of their own, a move into uh, other areas of, of community safety and health, out of hospital, card out arrest, emergency medical response, and MTFA, etc. And I think the, I think the the local uh, setup and the local arrangements assist that process as well, because I think the communication within those those areas and the areas that that may require, you know, some of those services, that there is good communication links and good uh, evidence of collaboration between uh, certainly blue light services and and some of the wider health and social care services as well. Thank you. I'm going to come, before I take from the police service, I'm going to come back in a minute and ask about uh, whether the Act could be improved in order to, uh, with specific reference to the local fire and rescue plans being agreed. So I'll just put that out there just now for you to think about that whilst I take the police answer to my first question, if I can. Well, first, um, I think a simple answer is, uh, despite what was written in the Act, I think how it was implemented in the uh, first perhaps two, three years um, actually hindered it. Uh, fundamentally, there was a focus on uh, certain aspects of structural and um, technical elements of building the service, um, the centralisation of budgets, the lack of empowerment um, uh, of decision making uh, within uh, territorial local divisions meant that there, there was a bit of withdrawing from partnership working, um, perhaps around about community planning. Um, I think that tide t has turned back again and the service recognised that and there's a project again under the Policing 2026 which t talks about local approaches to policing. So there's been a recognition that we need to regain some of that. Um, the one, uh, I suppose, caveat to that would be that the personalities and the individuals within local policing divisions, a lot of them remain constant and those working relationships stay there, sometimes under the radar of what was happening cent centrally. So I think there was still lots of good work going on. Um, perhaps not recognised or valued perhaps as much as it should have been in the first uh, few years. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Convener. I, th I, th I think this is always going to be one of those subjective uh, questions. And to some extent, it very much depends on where people take their, uh, take their interpretation of what connecting means. Um, you, you, know, you know, I know that the service would advocate that they've, you know, they've enabled communities to connect with the police service in a whole variety of innovative ways that didn't exist to the same extent uh, that they used to, principally because of advances in technology. But if you're talking about connection on the, the human level, um, depending on what part of policing or how you're exposed to policing, I would say that many of the communities would say no. Um, the, you know, the simple reality is, is that you know, the police service were withdrawing, and I use withdrawing carefully uh, here, you know, withdrawing from many communities in terms of physical presence, uh, long, a long time before the creation of the Police Service of Scotland. But what the Police Service of Scotland did is it provided no hiding place for that, uh, and it removed any illusion uh, of, uh, you know, connecting with the community through community assets um, uh, in a way that was a, that, that prevailed before. Um, and, you know, the obvious removal of police stations, largely as a consequence of finance, being the, the obvious example of that. So. You know, if, if you look at those that are involved in uh, advocacy groups for, uh, say, uh, you know, victims of uh, domestic violence, uh, or those that uh, are involved in, uh, you know, some of the large uh, inquiries that are ongoing into uh, um, historic sex abuse or uh, 
child abuse in uh, various different institutions. I'm sure that those that, are, that represent those communities uh, would say that that has been improved as a consequence of the single service. But if we're talking communities as we traditionally know them, pop, you know, clusters of uh, clusters of people living together in certain geographic areas, I suspect that many would say no. So. Uh, Sticking on the actual 2012 Act, because it set out some specific ways in which local policing plans uh, and the local fire and rescue plans uh, were to be agreed. So, do you take a view on whether the legislation itself could be improved to ensure that the local input uh, is as effective as possible? I'll take Mr. McGlone first, please. Quick diplomatic answer. I I'm quite happy to have a chat with the Deputy Assistant Chief Officers and local senior officers to get some feedback on that be before I get back to you, because I don't think I could give you a, a, a decent informed answer at the moment. So I'm quite happy to get back to you on that, if that's OK. okay. I don't, think, yeah, I don't think it needs to be changed to the Act. I think it's about interpretation of what's there, the ability of um, the relevant people with the right ability to, or the empowerment to make decisions at a locality level or a divisional level to get together, agree the plans, put the resources to it, and empower the staff to go out and deliver the service. I think, it, I think there's more than enough professional ability within that framework to deliver that. Thank you. Very quickly, convener, uh, I would largely agree with Ivor Marshall that the, the, the principles in the legislation remain sound. Th this is, this is an, an argument being rehashed from a number of years ago. Uh, the service, uh, in, the, in the first years of, this, uh, of its creation, gave the plan to the local, local areas to tell them to they agree on them. Uh, we've refined our approaches since then, but still haven't got it entirely right. Thank you. Shona. I think that's and been answered a bit. Changes the legislation. Okay. In that case, can I thank the witnesses very much for, for attending. If there's anything um, which uh, we haven't been able to cover regarding policing from Unison, then we'll follow up that in writing. But thank you all for a very worthwhile session. We now suspend um, to allow for a change of witnesses and a comfort break. Five minutes.
Agenda item three is an evidence session as part of our pre-budget scrutiny ahead of the publication of the Scottish Government's budget 2019-20 later this year. And I welcome Hamza Yusuf, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and James Wolfe, QC Lord Advocate, um, who are accompanied by their officials. I refer members to paper three, which is a private paper. And um, I understand that both the Cabinet Secretary and the Lord Advocate wish to make a brief opening statement, starting with the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener, and I will be brief. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me here today to give evidence as part of its pre-budget scrutiny. Uh, this budget will seek to maintain the Scottish Government's strong record of public service delivery to ensure stability, security and indeed quality of services right across Scotland. Uh, the principles that govern our justice system, including the rule of law, public safety and the protection of rights, are central to ensuring and maintaining sustainable economic growth and well-being. The justice system contributes significantly to our economy, employing tens of thousands of staff directly uh, and indirectly in critical roles across all parts of Scotland, protecting and maintaining key infrastructure, uh, ensuring safety at high-profile national and international events, uh, and challenging those who undermine legitimate businesses. Uh, the portfolio contributes towards longer-term prevention uh, and equality through, for example, our whole systems approach to youth crime, uh, violence reduction, and indeed tackling uh, adverse childhood experiences. As has been the case for the last decade, once again, we are delivering uh, the budget in very challenging circumstances. Uh, we continue to deal with the impacts uh, of the UK government's austerity uh, agenda and, and the uncertainty, of course, caused by Brexit. Uh, regret regrettably, we're now having to plan for a no-deal uh, Brexit. No-deal planning is already absorbing significant resources within justice agencies. Uh, maintaining the rule of law in the event of a no-deal Brexit will have a significant financial and operational impact on justice agencies, uh, further damaging our economy and our public services. This includes removing police officers from community duties in the event that they're called on to provide mutual aid, for example, to other UK police forces, uh, and the cost of funding additional police officers should that be required. <coughs> In spite of this challenging financial context over the past decade, justice agencies have performed well. Record crime is down 42%. Uh, this is down to the policy choices this government has made, but undoubtedly also, of course, to the commitment of all those working in the justice sector. Uh, the delivery of substantial and challenging public service reform uh, and rationalisation, including police and fire reform, have provided substantial and recurring reductions in revenue expenditure that are built into the Scottish Government's baseline budget, while maintaining and improving services. Uh, police and fire reform are on track to exceed the delivery of anticipated net savings of over £1.1 billion and £328 million, respectively, by 2027. Uh, last year, of course, the UK Government uh, finally acknowledged the uh, inequity uh, of forcing our police and fire services to PV pay VAT, a position that no other territorial police or fire service in the UK has faced. The uh, Scottish Government has ensured that communities will benefit in full from Police Scotland and SFRS being able to reclaim £35 million VAT from March 2018. Uh, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing heard in pre-budget scrutiny evidence from the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland about the potential uh, also for its uh, digital data and ICT proposals to transform policing. Uh, of course, uh, my calls, I would reiterate them uh, for the UK Government to fully reimburse the £175 million already paid in police and fire VAT over the previous five years. This would go a significant way in helping us to fund that DDICT transformation. Uh, within the wider Justice Portfolio Budget, we are directing resources in line with priorities and outcomes set uh, within our, our Justice Vision and Priorities document, developed and agreed jointly by key justice agencies and published last year. Uh, this includes increasing funding and services to support the victims of crime and also preventative services to help divert people away from crime and to reduce reoffending. Third organisations play a vital role in helping us to deliver these services. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, uh, and finally, and finally, and finally, uh, we want to use our budget to recognise the significant contribution made by those working in our justice sector. Uh, for example, the two and a half year pay deal uh, recently agreed for police officers will put significant cash into their pockets, giving them and their family certainty. I'm sure the committee will join me in recognising the very significant contribution that those who work in our justice sector make to making Scotland a safer place to live uh, and, and work and invest in. I'm happy to, of course, have this opportunity to assist the committee with its pre-budget scrutiny. Lord Advocate. 
Thank you, convener, uh, and thank you for the invitation to appear uh, today. Uh, during a period of significant change, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service has continued to fulfil its public responsibilities to prosecute crime and to investigate sudden, unexpected and suspicious deaths and to do so rigorously, fairly uh, and effectively. Uh, uh, and that's a tribute to the professionalism, commitment and skill of the service and of its staff. In line with the comments which the Crown Agent and I um, made to the committee last December, this year's budget has allowed the service to maintain staffing levels and to implement the public sector pay policy uh, for Scotland. The pay award was higher than in previous years and was implemented at an earlier point in the year to the benefit of staff. And the Crown Agent will be able to update the committee if it wishes about the position in relation to the various staffing issues which the committee has raised with us on previous occasions. Uh, the service has also made significant progress in delivering non-staff savings. It's reduced its estate costs while continuing to serve local courts and local communities across Scotland. It's now begun full implementation of the project to use tablets and digital case management uh, in court. Uh, that project has taken some time, but the time has been well spent with a view to getting the system right. When I last appeared before you in December, 2017, I referred to the services changing caseload, and I advised the committee that I had tasked the Crown Agent with scoping the implications of a strategic shift of resources to deal with serious sexual cases and other complex cases. Uh, that work formed the basis for the additional resource which the Scottish Government has made available to the service in the current budget year, and which I wrote to advise the committee about uh, in August. And I'm pleased to report the service has very recently been awarded an additional £1.1 million for the development of three new digital facilities. Uh, these increased resources uh, are, are the start of what uh, I anticipate will be a long-term initiative by the service to respond to the challenges presented by a changing caseload whilst meeting reasonable public expectations and at the same time continuing with the important work of system-wide reform. And both I and the Crown Agent will be happy to elaborate on the services plans in the course of this session or indeed in the future, if that would be of assistance to the committee. Thank you, Lord Advocate. We're going to start with um, a general question for the Lord Advocate and the same sort of general question for the Cabinet Secretary um, about additional in-year funding. John. Morning, panel. A question for yourself, Lord Advocate. It's about can you outline the work that the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service took to analyse the changing profile of its work and how that fed in to the additional in year funding, please? Um, yes, um, I mean, this, the, the um, starting point was a um, demonstrable change in the um, nature and complexity of the cases being reported to the service. We've had a we're seeing a secular decline in the absolute number of cases, but we're seeing a change in the profile. Um, most markedly in the context of sexual offending, um, I think when I last appeared before the committee, I reported a, a some 50% increase in the number of um, uh, reports of high court level sexual crime being reported to the service within a year. So that's an astonishing increase um, in, in that area of, or, or in that particular area of criminality. Uh, and that, that, yeah, that's welcome. That uh, uh, reflects confidence of complainers coming forward, cases being investigated and being prosecuted. Um, but um, uh, the service needs to respond to that and has been responding to that, uh, 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 that change. At, at the same time, we're seeing um, a, a, a body of large complex cases um, in different parts of the of the services caseload but perhaps illustrated by um, uh, uh, significant and complex serious organized crime cases um, um, and which present particular uh, demands um, at, at the same time we're seeing in local courts um, uh, uh, a change in the 
profile of cases and increasing complexity, uh, as I've mentioned, and indeed there too, an increase in the number of um, relatively serious sexual offences, so 19% increase of uh, sheriff and jury sexual offences um, in the same period as, as, as the one I mentioned. So the, the, I tasked the Crown Agent with looking um, across the piece at, at, at the implications of, of these changes for the work of the service. Um, and it's fair to uh, say that, as I understand it historically, the service has looked very much at, at, at the core need for prosecutors in courts up and down the country. Um, and of course that, in a sense, goes without saying. We need prosecutors uh, to be present in every court where a case is being prosecuted around the country. Uh, I tasked the Crown Agent with looking at, as it were, the preparation uh, side of, of matters uh, and look at what the service needed in, if, if it's to deal with this changing profile and to do so in a way that meets reasonable public expectations, recognising that evidence to this committee um, and the inspectorate and other um, evidence presents us with a, a, a picture of, of what the public um, reasonably demands of the service. Crown Agent did the work to look at the resources required to meet these various um, um, challenges um, and that formed the foundation for the, the, the analysis that underpins the additional funding. Thank you for that. Um, the, the Scottish Government announced uh, 3.6 million, Lord Advocate. Would you anticipate getting that maximum amount uh, of funding in the coming financial year? Well, I don't think it'd be right for me to um, anticipate what, what are ongoing budget um, uh, uh, negotiations, as the committee will appreciate. I think what I, what I can do is I can say that um, the the in-year funding reflected uh, the analysis of the resourcing needs of the service as I've described it. Um, and um, uh, in terms of uh, future budget, um, if the funding of the service doesn't, uh, uh, you know, doesn't reflect uh, that uh, analysis, then that will present me with the need to make, make choices about what I do uh, going forward. And finally, whilst accepting it's a, a robust analysis, is that an ongoing process you'll continue to look well, at? Well, the, 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 the service, of course, always has to react and respond to changes in the nature of the caseload and the volume of the cases. And, um, uh, and well, you know, while this was a, a significant and particular piece of work, um, looking, um, at, as it were, afresh at the needs of the service um, in response to the changing caseload. Um, um, the, you know, the service, I'm sure, will be keeping um, uh, keep, keep, keeping an eye on on, on changes as uh, as we go forward. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Just a clarification on, on that point, uh, Lord Advocate. Um, given this is primarily for, for staffing. Um, is there an assumption that that additional funding will be baselined for the, within the budget for future years? Um, you're absolutely right that the, the particular needs of the service relate to staff. Um, I mean, the, the core work of prosecution is undertaken by, by people. Um, the non-staff costs have, have um, uh, come down very significantly over the last period, and, and, and it is um, in staffing that the, that the additional resources is needed. Um, uh, plainly, if, if, if um, future budgets don't support the same level of staff, then, then the service would have to respond to that and, and, and choices would have to be made um, in light of particular budget allocations as to um, what the consequences would be for the service's work. Okay. Runa? Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, just to sort of follow on from, from that line of questioning, will, will the need for recruitment and training sort of delay the impact of that substantial extra funding that you've had, or had you anticipated that's how it would be spent? Um, inevitably, um, um, the recruitment process takes time. There's then a period of training um, and indeed a period um, um, during which um, uh, staff recruited to the service are building up their expertise in what is um, in many ways a very uh, a specialist professional activity, namely prosecution in the public interest. So there, there will undoubtedly be um, uh, uh, 
time before the additional resource translates into um, staff within the service, and the Crown Agent can probably give more detail of the, of the, the recruitment process. Um, it's also fair to say that the, the planned improvements, for example, in uh, bringing down the um, time to indictment, which is uh, 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 one of the um, one of the responses uh, uh, to reasonable public expectations. Uh, those plans will take time to implement. Um, um, they're dependent on staff being recruited, trained, and, and, and um, uh, work to, to get those uh, plans um, uh, implemented. But the plans are in place. Um, you know, the project is in hand, and um, you know, the services pressing forward with that um, uh, with, with, with some determination. Thank you. Okay. And Liam MacArthur on. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, you've talked, Lord Advocate, about um, the management of, of caseload. You've talked just there about um, the aspiration to bring down the time to indictment. Um, you'll be aware of the evidence received from Court and Tribunal Service shortly before the, the, the recess that while in welcoming the additional funding, it pointed up a potential difficulty that that change in the ability of um, Crown, Office, uh, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal to manage its workload could have consequential impacts on, um, for example, the Court and Tribunal Service. I'd just be interested to know um, whether you recognise that as a, a challenge and, and perhaps outline the discussions that have taken place with the likes of the SETS uh, about how that might be uh, done in a way that doesn't just shift the um, the, 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 the problems around uh, resources and the strains um, to another part of the system. It, 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 it's absolutely right that this is a whole system um, issue. What, what happens in one part of the justice system has a direct impact on other parts. So uh, what happens in, 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 in relation to policing feeds through to prosecutors, what prosecutors do feeds through to courts. That was refre reflected in um, the package that the Cabinet Secretary um, uh, made available 0.8 million of the in-year funding that I've received from Scottish Government was um, a, a transfer from the Cabinet Secretary specifically for sexual offences, and that was associated with uh, additional funding which he also made available to the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service at the same time uh, a, 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 as a package, and that that reflects the sort of joined up working that um, uh, is now, um, uh, as I perceive it, routine across the, 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 the justice system. Uh, I have regular meetings with the senior judiciary and the Crown Agent has regular interaction with um, uh, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and indeed other justice agencies um, and, and, and part of those interactions is about seeking to make sure that um, uh, the different parts of the system are, are so far as can be, um, uh, reasonably uh, aligned. What you've said, I mean, presumably you'd be quite surprised that the committee heard the evidence it, it did hear in the previous, uh, the previous session. And as I say, the, the specific concern was that while welcoming the, the, the funding, nevertheless, there was a concern that whatever had been transferred, and I assume they would have been aware of that, it, it wasn't necessarily um, obvious that that was sufficient to, to meet an additional uh, pressure on workload through the, the court and tribunal service. Well, I mean, or, or I can, I suppose, um, uh, if I look at it from the perspective of the head of the system of investigation and prosecution, I, of course, recognise that there's a uh, that, that when we're dealing with um, uh, justice, it's a whole system that one has to be mindful of, and um, uh, changes in the caseload. Uh, and I don't, uh, I don't necessarily see necessarily that additional funding for one part. Um, of itself, you know, how that impacts on other parts may, 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 may depend on analysis, but undoubtedly the change in caseload um, that we see is something that all parts of the system are having to, to, to respond to. Okay. Uh, we've got a follow-up question from Daniel, and then we'll move on to the additional in-year funding questions for the Cabinet Secretary. So, so my question sort of really follows on from Liam McCarthy's line of questioning. If you look at the... the uh, Fiscal's budget um, in real terms, uh, despite the 3.6 million in additional funding, uh, the, the, the funding level will still be below uh, that of the 2015-16. So to what extent 
will the 3.6 million actually fund additional resource and to what extent is that actually replacing resource that, that or, or capacity that has been lost in the last two or three years? Um, well, I think the f one thing that one needs to be alive to is that over that period, the service has um, been very effective in, in two respects. One is in responding to changes within the system um, and also in prioritising staff numbers relative to non-staff costs. And the proportion of, of um, the budget spent on non-staff costs has gone down significantly. At the same time, there's been a, a, a reduction in the number of senior staff and, a, again, a, a, a prioritisation of in terms of the numbers of um, uh, staff at the front line, if one can call it uh, 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 that. Um, what what uh, this funding does is it responds to the particular set of challenges that I described uh, a, a moment ago, um, and it will, if the services um, uh, plans in relation to recruitment uh, reach fruition, it will result in the service having a, a um, uh, as I understand it, a, 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 a higher staff level than it has ever had before. The Crown Agent will be able to, I suspect, give chapter and verse on that if, that's, uh, if that would be helpful. If, if I may, just very briefly, just uh, for clarification, um, the in year funding of 3.6 million, the full year equivalent is 5.8. So I just want to be clear about that in relation to, in relation to that funding. Um, insofar as staffing numbers are concerned, I'll be brief um, with uh, the additional um, uh, permanent staffing that we would be able to, to bring in with this uh, uh, funding, then it would take us to um, the highest number of, of staff we have ever had and also the highest number of prosecutors that we have ever had. The, the historic high in relation to prosecutors is 558. Um, if we can, um, if we're in a position to, to follow this through, then we will have over 600. And just so that I can be clear, um, I, I don't see it, uh, you know, this is not just about numbers, it's about the, um, the resource level that is needed uh, in order to respond to the complexity of the caseload, the nature of the caseload, um, and to seek to meet re reasonable public expectations in relation to the prosecution of crime and investigation of deaths. And um, uh, plainly from my perspective as head of the system, um, of prosecution in Scotland, it, 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 it's very welcome. So, 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 may, may I just, one, one further point was, was, was simply in relation to that. That high is 2009-2010 when we had um, the, 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 the actual cash budget at that time was 118 million. So, what, so just in terms of the, the non-staff savings that we have made in the interim, what I'm saying to you is that even within that budget, we would be in a position where we would be able to have mm -hmm. higher numbers than we have had before in contrast to that 118. Forgive yeah. me. Well, that's a very useful baseline. Um, can I just ask also about retention? Because obviously that's an, a critical element within this. In our last evidence session, uh, you know, we, we heard something that was maybe slightly surprising and that while we might well expect uh, prosecutors to be tempted away by more tempting job offers, it was maybe surprising to hear that so many of them are being tempted into the Scottish Government. Is there an issue there in terms of pay scales in comparison to other uh, uh, parts of the public sector? for the, the Crown Office? Um, well, I suppose the starting point is that, that since the 1990s, the service has fixed its own uh, pay and, uh, and, and grades, and the current levels within the service reflect choices made over, uh, uh, over a period of time. Um, I suppose in terms of, of, uh, of, of context, um, the retention rate of staff within the service um, uh, generally speaking, it, it, it is good. It is true to say that we've seen a, a, a loss of staff to Scottish Government, um, particularly in uh, recent period. Um, the, um, and indeed, we've seen a loss of, of, of um, uh, staff to the Shrievel bench, where the pay comparison is uh, 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 very, you know, it's very different from 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 from, 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 from the service. Before we develop that any further, we'll bring the cabinet secretary in as we as we intended to. So, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. It just follows on from that, if I may, cabinet secretary. So, uh, there's extra funding going into one side of the equation. So, are you comfortable that the resourcing of the other parts of the justice system will be sufficient uh, to ensure that any improvements made at that side uh, will flow through the whole system. 
Look, I think it's a really good question, and fundamentally, uh, you know, we have to work collaboratively to do our best, along with Justice Analytical Services and many, many others, to try to forecast as best we possibly can um, the impact of one funding decision or policy decision or guidance decision will have on another part of the justice system. To answer your question in short, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm confident, partly because the reasons that the Law Advocate um, has, has already articulated very, very well. So some of that funding uh, we don't necessarily think uh, will substantially increase the overall number of cases, but it's about, for example, speeding up uh, the process uh, around um, the high volume of sexual offences uh, that we've seen over the last uh, few years, uh, getting uh, FAIs uh, um, uh, ready to come to court uh, quicker, and so on and so forth. Um, so some of that is about speeding up as opposed to volume. So therefore, we have uh, some, some confidence. But our dialogue with, with, with the Justice Board um, is hugely important for me. So the Justice Board, as, as members will know, and there's a subgroup of that Justice Board, brings together um, you know, colleagues right across the criminal justice system um, on an operational level, on a policy level, and importantly, on an analytical level. Uh, they review current trends, potential future trends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and, and it's important for us to take that uh, very much into account. So, yes, confident, but um, clearly, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of ongoing discussion. Thank you. Can you uh, perhaps help me out? Just uh, it might have been to a, uh, an extent touched on what you said at the end there. But what analysis has been done? It, what, what robust scenario planning has been done to analyse an increase in funding at that point will have whatever impact at at the end point? And therefore, that's the funding that's required. What analysis? Have yeah, you? so this is where the Justice Analytical Services that we have are, are, are hugely impressive and, and a hugely impressive team, I have to say, when I took over my role uh, as Cabinet Secretary for Justice, when I met the team, uh, the amount of work that they do, the statistical information that they have at their hands uh, to be able to do some of that, uh, that's why they are such a key member of the Justice um, uh, Board uh, that exists. But also, you know, the, the, the regular statistics uh, that are available. I think the member will be aware of, 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 of some of them. For example, um, Police Scotland's quarterly management um, information on particular crime types, um, Crown's uh, data on prosecution levels, for example, um, SCTS quarterly data, which was already mentioned on criminal court volumes, um, criminal justice social work statistics, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, I get weekly prison population figures. So using all that statistical evidence, uh, using the expertise of the Justice Analytical Services, using the expertise around the table of the Justice Board, all of that feeds into policy decisions, funding decisions, guidance changes that we tend to make, particularly when we think there might be a substantive, um, substantive uh, impact. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, if you could share some of that analysis with the the Justice Committee, that would be very useful mm. if you... What particular analysis, uh, Convener? The analysis you've just referred to on the court service, various other um, organisations okay. within the Justice Service. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on uh, with the Cabinet Secretary. We're, we're particularly interested in the funding of the third sector organisations. After we've completed that, we'll move back to the Lord Advocate and ask more staffing questions. <coughs> so, Shona. Uh, morning. You'd be aware that uh, there was um, evidence taken from third sector organisations uh, around their um, various uh, priorities and, uh, and um, analysis of, of the funding position. I guess my, my question would be to you as obviously the newly appointed Cabinet Secretary, what you think the areas of priority should be in the funding of the third sector in areas of, of civil and criminal justice. Um, it would be useful maybe as a follow-up to have a, a breakdown of the, the funding of third sector organisations within the justice sector. don't expect you to produce that today, but as a follow-up, that would be good. Um, but you know, from your perspective, where would you see the priorities? And do you think there is an opportunity, which we explored with the third sector organisations, to have a more strategic approach to funding of those organisations? So rather than them competing, if you like, for doing the same things with the same uh, funding pots, is there an opportunity to do things uh, more strategically and avoid duplication where, where possible? And how could that be achieved? Yeah, I think it's a whole, whole host of, of really good questions. Um, uh, 
I mean, I think in terms of priorities, if I can try to answer that question, what we hope I've been able to demonstrate within the first, you know, 100 plus days of being in the role where some of my priorities are and where I think community justice is absolutely essential to some of that. So, for example, strengthening uh, the support for, for victims and indeed families of, of, of victims of homicide uh, in particular, but certainly victims um, and, and the most vulnerable victims. I think that is... Uh, absolutely essential, uh, and, and support from community justice absolutely essential to, to help us with that agenda. You know, different side of the same coin to that is is rehabilitation of of offenders, and uh, never forgetting uh, our, our our duty uh, to that. Uh, and, and a number of organisations, community justice organisations, again vital to to make progress uh, in, in that area. Related somewhat to both those uh, agendas, uh, of course, is uh, effective early intervention as well. The ACES agenda we've talked much about and, and is often talked about, uh, of course, but early effective intervention uh, from young age. And I saw a great example of that in um, West Lothian Council on a, a couple of months ago. Um, of where the community justice organisations working closely with local authority were making a really, really big impact um, on, on, on uh, <coughs> levels of youth crime. Um, and, and, and uh, yeah, th th those are, are some of the priorities. I'm going to go on and on and on, but uh, th those are some of the key kind of themes and, and, and key priorities uh, for, for, for me. Um, some of your other questions, I think um, Community Justice Scotland has a huge role to play in terms of an overarching body and organisation to, to, to prevent some of that duplication. I have to say I've been hugely impressed in this portfolio uh, by the willingness of partners to work really closely and collaboratively together. Um, you see that particularly well, for example, when it comes to tackling issues uh, and giving support around uh, issues around sexual offences and rape um, from organisations like Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis Scotland and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think Community Justice Scotland has, has, has certainly a role to play in that. Bringing the right people around the table, uh, any ministerial role uh, is always useful in helping to do that. So the Victims Task Force that I announced um, j just a couple of weeks ago, uh, hopefully we'll be able to play a role uh, in that uh, as well. Um, and uh, so I'd like your question around the breakdown. Yes, I'm, I'm sure, I, don't, I don't have it top of my head, but I'm, I'm sure we can provide you with that in, in writing. I can provide it to the committee through the convener. Okay. Is this on subject, um, Daniel? I hope so. I'll let others in, uh, judge that. If, if you're not sure, perhaps you can leave it to No, it, it, well, it is. It's about Community Justice Scotland and their role. I mean, my understanding is that, that we're moving to a commissioning model in terms of the, the, the uh, procurement of these services from third sector. I mean, there, there is some concern that, that that has sort of slightly, if you forgive me, neoliberal connotations. I mean, what, what, what efforts are you making to make sure that it, that it doesn't and that it is about partnership working as opposed to sort of a, a bidding process? Yeah, and, and uh, you know, as I say, I've been really heartened by what I've seen from the organisations uh, thus far, but I, I also picked up some of that concern that undoubtedly you've picked up through your evidence sessions uh, and in conversation. All I can say at this moment in time is that I'm, I'm more than happy and more than willing to make sure that we get the ethos right as well as the mechanisms and the processes right. So uh, those concerns are ones that, that I've also heard as uh, much, as, much as you have and uh, uh, are keen to, 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 to make sure we continue to work with community uh, justice organisations to make sure that the new arrangements that we have in place uh, uh, do not impact them in a negative way and it's not a... Uh, I mean, inevitably, there's, the, 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 you know, when you're going for one source of funding, the, the, there is that competitive element to it and that's understand it and, and, and understandable uh, but certainly that collaborative approach which I've been really impressed with thus far I want it to continue so um, ref reflective of the point uh, understand that it's, it's, it's been raised and understand it's been raised uh, with us as well as, as with yourself um, but certainly willing to work with uh, organisations to make sure that it's um, is the they're not negatively impacted. Multi-year funding is that going to be addressed within the that that process? Multi-year funding yes, is raised mean, by a number of organisations. Is that going to be addressed as well? Yes, I mean, we, 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 there's a number of organisations that, that uh, are on receipt of multi-year funding uh, from us: uh, Victim Support Scotland, um, Migrant Help. Uh, Tara, who work with uh, victims of, of, of human trafficking, uh, they're all in receipt of multi-year funding. Uh, so I can completely understand the sense and see the sense where multi-year funding uh, is helpful to organisations. The more we can do that, uh, clearly the better. But as you know, we operate in that one-year uh, budget process. But we are doing it in some elements uh, where we can do it further. Then, yes, I'm, I'm very open-minded uh, to that where it is possible and appropriate. Thank you, Rona. Thank you. Just, just briefly, on the funding breakdown question, um, 
Does the information you hold extend to organisations funded indirectly uh, by the Scottish Government, in particular money going to uh, local authorities, um, where obviously the, that's the front line and where decisions are made and where the funding goes? Do you have that information on, on what you know, local authorities are funding, basically? I don't hold the information centrally, but I'm more than happy to, to, to work with Community Justice Scotland to see what information as a new body uh, for, for Community Justice right across the country to, to see what information they hold uh, and how to be collated. Obviously, excuse me, as, as, as we tend to do with local authorities, um, you know, they, they are our are, are place well to how to spend that money uh, to get the maximum impact locally uh, within their communities. So, um, you know, we don't hold the information centrally, uh, but uh, happy to work to see where there are information gaps and, and see where we can plug them. That would be useful. Thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur, second yeah, question, perhaps. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, Daniel Johnson's covered some of what I was going to cover in relation to the, um, the concerns we'd heard about um, the lack of reliability or predictability of funding. You've given uh, a couple of illustrations, Cabinet Secretary, of, of where um, something beyond an, a, an annual allocation of funding is, is provided which does, I think, open up um, a, 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 a question as to whether, well, why if it can be provided in these areas, it can't be provided in other areas. I think we're seeing from uh, the health, health portfolio uh, where such an approach is, is, is being taken. I think one of the concerns that was, it was being um, uh, laid out to us was around uh, how you can plan at all for the, the longer term delivery of a uh, of a service that is absolutely integral to um, achieving a range of, of the the, the, uh, the objectives that you've uh, and the Lord Advocate have laid out. Um, if on, a, on an annual basis you're sending out redundancy notices um, two three months before uh, budgets are, are 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 signed off, so. I mean, can we have a, a, a perhaps a, a clearer commitment to look again at, at, at the extent to which um, a greater level of certainty over a two, three, um, ideally longer period, uh, budget allocations can be set out? Yeah. I'm more than happy to, to take that away, and as I say, I'm, I'm more than acutely aware that it was raised uh, to you as, as, as justice committee members. Uh, so you know, it'd be wise for us to, to, to reflect on that. Some of that is within our gift. Some of that, of course, um, maybe uh, needing further collaboration with local authorities, obviously through criminal justice, uh, social work, um, community justice, sorry, the social work, um, pots of funding, and, 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 and therefore um, conversations with local authorities uh, on, on that as well. But you know, the point I think is well articulated and. and, and um, all I can say at this stage is yes, I'm, I'm more than happy to take a look and reflect on that point further. I, one of the other concerns that has been raised alongside that was that where um, initiatives taken forward by, by Scottish Government, ones that, that have the support of, of um, many of these third sector organisations, there isn't necessarily an early engagement with uh, those same organisations about the, the, the budgetary impacts, uh, the rollout of, or the change of that legislation, or the rollout of, of, of those policy changes. Uh, might have. I mean, again, uh, that's something that would be very much within your gift, and, and, and certainly you would expect government to take a, a lead role, but be informed in terms of um, the way in which uh, any decisions that, 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 that you're taking are going to impact on the third sector, rather than simply take the decision which may have support, um, but which leaves a number of third sector organisations in the uncomfortable position of either having to try and deliver that and make and make changes to, to whatever else it is that they're delivering uh, or, or, or simply spread the jam far, far more thinly than, than would be ideal. I mean, I've always thought it the, the most, sensible, most sensible approach, and we try to do this as, as much as uh, uh, much as we possibly can, of course, uh, is, is, is by co-design, really. So understanding from those that are at the co-face, um, those organisations that are working with be it victims of crime, or indeed be it uh, those who have perpetrated crime, and anybody in between, what are what are the needs of those individuals? How do you rehabilitate the offender, or how do you provide that victim support? You tell us, uh, and, and, and Rape Crisis Scotland, uh, Victim Support Scotland are, are great examples of of, of uh, organisations that have helped to develop my early thinking uh, within within, as you say, the kind of first hundred plus. Uh, days um, around, you know, where our funding priorities should be for the future, and so on and so forth. So we can, if we can, if we can co-design with them where our funding priorities uh, should be, then, then, then hopefully we avoid that situation that Lee MacArthur articulates uh, well. But uh, yes, I take the point absolutely fully that we're, we've still got a way to go to, to get there. And 
And finally, the, the a concern that was raised with us by um, family mediation. I was working in, in terms of family mediation, and I should declare an interest as um, my wife's involved with Radio, uh, Relationship Scotland, Orkney, um, was that in terms of the funding available, there are very few shows in town. The Scottish Government, um, there's big lottery funding, a degree of local government funding as well. Um, is it your view that um, either an awareness of or a greater biodiversity in, in, in funding pots needs to somehow be stimulated in order to, to, to try and cover the breadth of, of demand there is for, for this sort of funding? Where if, in a sense, if you fall out of favour with, with Scottish Government and, and you've, you've had a, an allocation of funding from big lottery that in, inevitably, because of the way they operate, has to come to an end. Um, in a sense, the, the, there's a kind of cliff edge with that service upon which many people, often very vulnerable people, may be, may be reliant. I think it's actually a really good point that, that, that there's raised now. Again, I'll reflect on, on how we do this, but um, you know, th th there's, an, there's been a couple of organisations that have, have, have written to me, and again, my, my kind of relatively new uh, role where um, they have had funding challenges, um, and uh, I immediately look at their projects and, and, and think, uh, of course, there's a process to go through undoubtedly, but I immediately think, well, there'd be a number of other funders that I'm sure would be interested in organisations that are providing XYZ service, um, and it's about making that link. And I know probably most members around this table, as I know I have, uh, do a funders fair locally, for example, uh, where you bring in the funders and the amount of organisations that then turn up and go, I didn't quite realise XYZ funder was able to provide funding for, for my project. Uh, maybe from a justice perspective, we can reflect on the community justice partners that we have the funders that are out there wider and see if we're able to help to make that connection because you know you, you, your central point is one that I, I wouldn't disagree with that um, the further uh, the more diversity sorry uh, that there is in funding pots um, and, and, and the better for everybody actually yeah I think that the, um, relationship Scotland did make the point that you know for the big funding it was either the lottery or the Scottish government and you know that was a very stark um, message um, Fulton the supplementary yeah, thanks, Convener. It's just following on from uh, the point raised by Rona Mackay and Liam MacArthur. I'm just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary uh, has any plans to to, bring, to implement guidance for local authorities around specific agencies. And the example I'm thinking about, which is relevant just now, is in my own local authority area, there is some innovative work um, going on in justice, um, particularly local authority run. However, there has been recent uh, decreases to the women's aid. Uh, the local women's aid budget, uh, which is, is obviously not went down well, um, and is against, I suppose, the government policy objectives. So, is there any is there any plans around that? I suppose, in some respects, that the, 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 there are right across ministerial portfolios can often be a tension uh, uh, between local authority and, and, and government around how money should be spent. Uh, priorities, national priorities, and that's in any ministerial role. I remember mean, as Minister for Transport and you know, talk, often talk about the active travel agenda and um, you know, how our national vision is not perhaps being, being, being realised by all local authorities. And, and, and I think in some respects we have to accept that that tension will exist if we, if we want to give local authorities the autonomy um, to, 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 to do as they, uh, as they think best. Um, but uh, how I help to address that, and look at my previous portfolio, how I help to address that is to make sure that the relationship with COSLA, with local authorities, is a really, really good one. Um, and I think that's probably the best way to do it. And, and, and the few local authorities that I've managed to visit uh, in this portfolio uh, thus far, um, there are some excellent examples, uh, really good examples of good practice. Um, I mentioned West Lothian uh, earlier on around uh, effective early intervention. Um, if we can share some of that and, and maybe even think about forums by which we can share some of that. Um, so there isn't singling out one local authority say you're not doing what we expect you know, the, the nationally for you to do, but instead saying actually here's some really good practice from uh, one local authority how about replicating that if it's suitable for your local authority. So, um, But I, I, I accept that that tension almost inevitably will, will always exist in some way, shape or form. I don't know about you, Cabinet Secretary, but I'm a big Joe Biden fan, and he once said that, don't tell me your values, show me your budget, and I'll tell you what your values are. And so from that perspective, given that the Community Justice Services budget is £35 million, and the Scottish Prison Service budget is £361 million, 
What does that say about the values of non-custodial sentences uh, versus community uh, justice orders and provision? And do you expect that to change in the future, reflecting many of the things that you've said publicly, which I, mean, I would broadly agree with in terms of the need for the emphasis on non-custodial uh, options for sentences? The latter part of his question, um, I absolutely agree with him. I would expect that um, balance to shift to some degree. Uh, I'm certainly, as he knows, uh, very supportive and, and will be looking to, to bring forward a presumption against short sentences of 12 months or less. I, his party position, you know, timescales might be slightly different, but generally an understanding that short custodial sentences are not as effective for rehabilitation when it comes to, uh, in comparison to, 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 to community uh, sentences. So, uh, yes, in some respects, uh, inevitably a shift on that. That being said, um, you know, there, there are calls from his party, in fact, from probably almost every party uh, around the table that, um, you know, people that commit the most heinous uh, and the most serious crimes uh, that have to be and should be <coughs> uh, uh, locked up in jails, in custody, um, should be serving uh, sentences, and so, uh, long sentences, and uh, those sentences for the most heinous uh, of crimes, um, when it comes to those on, on, on life sentences, are serving longer. Uh, and, and, and you have to have them in, in jails, uh, and, and that is uh, the fact of life. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I see some misreporting sometimes. Uh, which doesn't fit in with the Scottish Government's um, vision. I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, you know, a recent um, newspaper had a splash on the front page around um, replacing Barlini, uh, for example, and talked of a super jail. The government isn't doing super jails, doesn't do super jails. You know, if it were to replace uh, Barlini, you'd be looking at uh, around about the same capacity. It's not about um, having to lock uh, more people up. Uh, yes, some people will uh, have to go to jail and have to be in prison, and, 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 and public safety is absolutely and utterly paramount. But um, yes, I, I, I agree with his uh, general sentiment that um, if we can rehabilitate more people and you know, community uh, sentences are more effective in doing so, then yes, I would expect that shift. And, and, and past the presumption against short sentences would be a demonstration, I would hope, of, of that. So again, to start by agreeing with you, I mean, you're, you're never going to do away with the need for prison, and, it, and especially for the most heinous of crimes, and, and not least because there's a, a need to, uh, to guarantee public safety, which sometimes only prison can do. However, in order for community justice uh, orders and provisions to be um, effective, they also need to be robust and they need to be trusted. And therefore, th th that needs a, a level of investment. And given, if you delve into that 35 million pound figure, it's only 12 million pounds which is actually spent on, on, those, on those provisions. I mean, do you agree with me that in order to have that trust, there needs to be robust investment and consistent investment, which again, touches very much on the point that, that, that some of the points that Liam MacArthur was raising about having the consistency of, of, of programmes, but also actually the rigour and robustness, which ultimately costs money. Uh, I would agree with that. It's fair to say, though, I mean, it's not, uh, not of any surprise to anybody that, of course, uh, you know, the cost of keeping somebody in prison versus the cost of a community sentence, an effective community sentence, obviously, is very stark. Um, and people would, would, would understand that. And therefore, it's, it's not right to, to just compare the figure of for community sentences with versus the figure for prisons. Though I understand uh, the reason why he makes comparisons, and I, I, I don't disagree with his uh, general kind of um, uh, point that, that he's trying to make. Some of it also goes back to the nature of cases, and Lord Advocate will, will undoubtedly keep me right. But um, when it comes to, to high court cases, I think uh, last time I spoke to, to Lord President, it was in around 80% were, were sexual offences and, and, and rape cases. And therefore, the nature of cases are such, then undoubtedly, then there uh, may be, be a need for 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 those people um, to to be in to be in prison. Um, that does not take away rehabilitation or the hope of rehabilitation, but that for public safety um, it may be the right place. The nature of the crimes and the offences also play a part in, in all of this. But again, I don't think actually there's too much disagreement between myself and and, and, and Daniel Johnson. And as I say, I would hope to see a shift. Um, um, away from um, prison spend in the future and, and, and more towards, you know, rehabilitation efforts that we know work and, and work well. So, so, so just finally, and on that, that public trust point, and, and again, I mean, I think that, that what's critically important is not just that we have these options, but that they're, they're understood by the general uh, public, that they know what the content 
of these orders are and what, what happens. Therefore, do you think there needs to be some investment in actually public perception, public awareness of what actually community justice means, rather than just doing it by, uh, in and of itself? I think that's a, that's a really good point, um, because uh, people, the vast, I think the vast majority of people's perception of a community sentence is uh, they've got off with it, you know, it's not, 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 a, not, a, not a harsh enough sentence. And without understanding the, or the, 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 the ethos behind it, the rehabilitation, the potential to rehabilitate, uh, and, and what that means for then hopefully having fewer victims of crime uh, very much in the future. But I think it's a very good point and something for us to reflect on that, um, you know, do we need to, 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 to look at how we uh, work on the public narrative? Now, some of that is, is, is government's responsibility, I'm sure, and, and we'll look at that and reflect on it. But some of that also is is, is, is is all of our responsibilities around this table. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important that all of us, uh, you know, based on the data, based on the facts, that we have the, the justice analytics, we, we we stick to those facts and talk about what actually works in terms of rehabilitation, and don't dismiss it as a soft option or a soft touch option, and so on and so forth. So I think it's really really important that yes, the government reflects on that, and, and we do some of that narrative work. But equally, we've all got responsibility in that. Okay, and um, if we can move back to to the Lord Advocate on the the issue of. Um, the disparity uh, in, in pay, uh, the FDA have, have pr produced very good information in their table specifically that shows, for example, even starting a legal trainee um, in the Crown and Procurative Fiscal Service is paid 27% less than a legal trainee in the Scottish Government. And this then has a knock-on effect. I believe some years ago there was an agreement um, with the len then Solicitor General and um, I think it was the deputy chief executive of the COPF that there would be an equivalent kind of grading to the, the government's payments uh, for um, qualified solicitors and um, the, the Crown and Fiscal Services. However, the knock-on effect sees, for example, a procurator fiscal deputy being paid 39,780 and the equivalent in the Scottish Government 46,889. So at various points, because of this disparity, it can be a 27%, a 50%, a 15%, always in the wrong direction. Could you address that? Yes, um, uh, and um, I, I suppose it goes back to the point I made uh, in response to Daniel Johnson, that the starting point is the aut autonomy that the service has had in relation to pay and grading since the 1990s. And the position that we're in reflects decisions made by the service and no doubt also by Scottish Government over, 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 over a long period of time. Um, I I'll come back to deal specifically with that in a moment, if I may. Um, it is true to say, and the Crown agent will, would no doubt be able to give more specifics on this, that we, the service continues to um, attract large numbers of applicants for both legal and administrative jobs. And I suspect that's because being a public prosecutor is, is a, an immensely rewarding uh, professional um, experience. And I'd like to think it's an exciting time for people to be um, working in uh, the service, um, there's a lot happening in the justice system, um, the, the service is full of um, uh, uh, immensely skilled, um, dedicated, uh, d dedicated people. Um, so I think that's, the, the con uh, that, that, that's part of the context. I suppose part of, that, part of the context for, 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 for that is that if one broadens out the comparisons, um, the average salaries for solicitors in private practice, according to the Law Society, Yes. Um, uh, Lord Advocate, uh, while, yes, they are dedicated, then mm. we did hear morale was down and that people were leaving the service. And if that disparity continues, then it isn't sustainable um, that the Procurator Fiscal Service is going to retain the level of skill um, that it, it requires to function properly. Yes, well, I was going to come, come um, in a minute and, and, and deal directly with that, but perhaps I, I, I can do that. Now, um, I think the figures are that the service has lost 59 staff to other government departments since January 2014, and it's 
correct to say that the rate of departure has increased over the last 18 months. And in addition, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a loss of staff to, to the bench, which is perhaps a reflection of the, of the skill that, that convener you, 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 you've identified. Um, the, there are no doubt a range of reasons for, for that, but undoubted, uh, and the service has always, uh, there have always been staff who've moved on from the service for a variety of, of, of reasons. Um, but um, the pay differential is, is, is there. Um, undoubtedly, the service would like to reduce that differential, um, but that, of course, has resource implications um, if, if, if that uh, were uh, to, be, to, to, to be done. And I, I, I suppose one does have to look at it in, in the context where service continues to attract applicants um, and the comparison uh, and the rate of retention, gen you know, generally speaking, is at, an, uh, at, or the rate of turnover is at a historic low at the moment. That's not to say that uh, certainly I view with any equanimity uh, uh, the um, loss of skilled staff to, 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 uh, from the service. Um, a concern that the FTA will, and other unions were, were at pains to point out to the committee. Very briefly, Liam Kerr, a supplementary. Yeah, just uh, very briefly on that point, Lord Advocate, uh, you would presumably concede that that pay differential that the conveners highlighted does make entry into the profession and indeed transfer into the profession somewhat unattractive uh, for particularly younger lawyers entering the profession. Well, I suppose there are two, there are two separate, uh, it strikes me there are two separate questions looking at at least the information I've got, which is um, the service continues to attract um, uh, a high number of applicants for entry into the profession of prosecutor. And that may reflect the fact that if one looks at the law society's figures for um, the profession as a whole, um, the, 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 the median average sal salary for a solicitor is 35,000 in private practice on the, on, on the figures from the Law Society's data. So yeah, that's a broader context, and also because I think the job of being a prosecutor is an immensely attractive and rewarding one. Um, so that's uh, at the level of entry. Um, it is true to say that um, uh, staff from the prosecution service um, for a variety of reasons have always uh, moved on. We have seen an increase in the number of staff who are going to other parts of the public service and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't dispute for a moment that part of the context for that is the, is the pay differential that's been identified. Analyze that. D is there any analysis done of why people are moving? Um, the Crown Asia will be able to give the detail, but as I understand it, people are, 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 are asked um, yeah. what, why they move so, on. So, that, so there, are, there are exit interviews. Um, and so just, just to contextualise, Lord Advocate mentioned uh, 59 uh, to government, um, other government departments since 2014. 11 of them are lawyers. So the vast majority are non-lawyers, but that, that perhaps helps to contextualise. And um, uh, during that same period, we, we actually lost 14 to the bench. Um, summary sheriff, sheriff, uh, etc. So that again just contextualises in terms of, for want of a better phrase, the markets in which we're competing um, in terms of our more um, experienced staff. Is do you analyse the reason that people move? Is it possible to provide the committee with data to say the pay differential was the reason that people transferred? Um, whether it's um, statistically significant, I can certainly indicate that, that um, a pay is mentioned in, in a significant proportion of, of uh, those who have the departure interviews. Thank you. Any um, further information you could give on, on the reasons why you, you think people are leaving the service would be helpful to the, course, no the, the committee. Yes. There's just one final uh, question for the Cabinet Secretary. What conversations, Cabinet Secretary, have you had with Police Scotland um, about its call for what it considered an absolutely crucial amount of funding, uh, £298 million for its IT project? Police Scotland, uh, the <coughs> Chief Constable uh, and a couple of his colleagues uh, presented the, 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 the business case to me, the outline business case uh, to me uh, for, for their ask. Um, from, from my perspective, um, you know, completely in principle understand the reasons for that. Um, I don't think I have to go over the issues around you know, the I-6 previously, uh, the legacy issues, etc., etc. Um, 
caveat to all this, I should say, is that we, we, we do invest in, 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 and give uh, money to, to, to Police Scotland, um, for example, through the reform budget to, to, to upgrade ICT. But you know, this is a huge, substantial um, change uh, that's being asked for with a, with, with a quite a, a hefty uh, price tag. So um, in principle, of course, support the reasons why, understand the reasons why, but clearly they will be subject to, to, to budget negotiations, budget discussions, uh, and so on and, and so forth. But to, to answer your question direct, yes, uh, the, the, the Chief Constable and, and his colleagues have presented uh, that case directly to, to, to me. And you are considering it? Well, <laughs> it's, it's my, for my colleague, I'd imagine, to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, uh, mm -hmm. undoubtedly, to, as part of budget discussions that he and I uh, will undoubtedly have. But um, you know that, that that is very much subject to, to affordability. That two hundred ninety-eight million uh, is is not a small number. Yeah, I think the the the, um, the chief constable had suggested even to stand still would cost a considerable amount of money, 90 million perhaps? Yes, I mean, I, I think doing nothing is not an option. So hence why I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning the, the kind of money we've we, we spent uh, through the reform budget um, or allocated through the reform budget uh, to, to ICT uh, intervention. So, so, so doing nothing is, is, is not an option. Um, but certainly, as I say, the, 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 the kind of full boon of the, the, the digital data and ICT transformation that's been talked about, as I say, in principle, uh, supportive of proposals, but clearly subject to affordability. Okay, thank you all very much. That concludes our line of uh, questioning. Can we suspend for one minute just to allow the Lord Advocate and the Crown Agent to, to leave? I was very remiss in not introducing at the very beginning. And um, the Cabinet Secretary is remaining for our next agenda item. The next agenda item is consideration of a legislative consent memorandum relating to the Offensive Weapons Bill currently before the UK Government, which touches upon devolved matters, and to which the Scottish Government is recommending that the Parliament gives our consent to the UK Parliament to the relevant provisions in the Bill. I refer members to Paper 4, which, uh, paper four, which is a note by the Clerk, and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a very brief opening uh, statement. I got the emphasis, uh, Convener. <laughs> uh, the Offensive uh, Weapons Bill was introduced into the House of Commons, as you say, by the UK Government in, in June this year. It contains a wide number of provisions uh, that apply all across the UK, with many provisions extending uh, to Scotland. Some of those provisions, uh, such as the new offence, uh, banning the sale of corrosive products to under-18s fall in reserved areas, but many are uh, devolved. Um, some of the following fall in devolved areas, the new offence of possession uh, of a corrosive substance in a public place, uh, new controls of the sale uh, of knives and other bladed articles when, when bought remotely, uh, and indeed the banning outright of the possession of certain dangerous knives uh, and other offensive weapons. Um, there are a number of, of other technical minor provisions uh, that also uh, fall into devolved competencies. Uh, as the Scottish Government's uh, legislative consent memorandum explains, the, the area of law is complex mix of both reserved uh, and, 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 and devolved. Um, I could give you some examples of that, but uh, your need for brevity, uh, I don't think I will. Um, one uh, one option would have been to obviously legislate through devolved areas through a bill in the Scottish Parliament, but I think it's preferable to have a, a UK-wide uh, framework uh, on that. Uh, the desire to have consistent laws operating uh, across the UK, I think, is, is, is sensible uh, very much in this case. So Scottish Government and, and UK Government agree it makes policy sense to, to ensure um, these types of restrictions operate as much as possible consistently across the United Kingdom. And I can advise the Scottish Government, UK Government have worked constructively together in devolved areas within the bill, uh, including um, in particular in relation to new restrictions on the sale of knives and other bladed uh, articles. I do have some concern to, to conclude. Um, convener on, on, on what is being reported as a, uh, what we've seen as a delay uh, in this process from the UK government uh, through, through, through the House of Commons and in fact some of the reported reasons for the delay in that. Um, but uh, we'll continue to work collaboratively with the UK government. Happy to answer any questions. Um, questions from Member Shona. 
Just on, on the last point there, um, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned that the, the bill was delayed again um, in, in Westminster. Do, do you know anything surrounding the details of that, and will it affect our, our LCM? Well, only largely what's being um, reported. Uh, I have to say, uh, you know, I'm trying, we're, we're, we have been working very collaboratively with the UK government. And I should caveat what I'm about to say with, with, with those remarks. But if what is being reported is true, uh, then it is frankly a disgrace. The, the reason that this uh, legislation is being postponed is because it might make life difficult for the UK government because of the, you know, the Tory rebels and other rebels uh, around uh, the Brexit issue might just look to, to cause a defeat for the UK government. If that, which is being reported, is, is, is true, then it, then it is, an, is an utter disgrace. Um, we have a particular interest in Scotland. On this legislation, every single member uh, around this table will remember the tragic case of Bailey, uh, Bailey Gwynn. And, um, of course, this legislation looks to put further enforcement in place to prevent um, that kind of situation from happening uh, again uh, when it comes to the sale of knives online, purchased online, and no longer being able to be delivered to somebody's house or residence, but actually they having to collect it, uh, show ID, further enforcement uh, of who is picking up that weapon. Uh, frankly, uh, the fact that this legislation could be delayed because of you know, politics and party politics, um, really, it does not do justice to the memory of, of, of Bailey uh, Gwynn. Cabinet Secretary, thank you. You've, you've outlined exactly why it's important we get on with this now, and that is helpful. Shona and... Um, yeah, I, I was hugely concerned to hear about the potential delay, and I wonder if you could expand on you know, what the impact of that may be and whether you'll be making representations, obviously, to the UK government about that uh, uh, delay and what they are going to do about it. And if you could keep the committee informed um, about the, the progress of, of those discussions, I think the, the fact that it covers really important things like acid um, attacks and the huge public concern about that, and as you say about the online knife sales, I think any delay uh, would be extremely um, um, unforgivable, really. Um, so if you could perhaps just expand on what, what communications you're going to have around this. Yes, I, I will write to the UK government uh, on this. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping the reasons that are being reported uh, in, in, in the press are, are not uh, the reasons, and, and, and there are other good reasons, but it is, is the second time that uh, this delay uh, has ha, has occurred, so it is extremely worrying. Um, you know, it's... Uh, you know, uh, I understand there are, of course, legislative pressures with Brexit. Everybody understands that. But, uh, you know, the, the, the day job cannot be ignored. And the, this is uh, not just any piece of legislation. It's a hugely important piece of legislation, not just for Scotland. But uh, Shona Robinson is absolutely right with um, some of the increases that we've seen uh, with the use of corrosive substances, particularly in the London metropolitan area. Then uh, this is an important piece of legislation from the entire, entire uh, United Kingdom. Daniel, followed by Lee McArthur. R restricting access to and therefore the sale of offensive weapons is clearly hugely important. However, what this legislation will do is increase the number or category of items that we're asking retail workers to enforce the law around and therefore act as agents of the law. We also know that, that enforcing age restrictions can be a source of abuse and violence. As the Cabinet Secretary may know, I'm drafting a, a member's bill concerned with this. I'm just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary thinks that there's a need to reflect on what we're asking retail workers to do and maybe uh, have some sort of thought around the protection that retail workers need or and certainly uh, look at, at the, the, the elements of the law that we're asking them to uphold in the round. Uh, yes, I will reflect on that. I don't think Daniel Johnson and I have had a, a kind of in-depth discussion about the members' bill he's taking forward, but if you'd find it helpful uh, to do so, then, then I'd, I'd more than happy to, to, to commit to do that. I still need some persuading, I have to say, on it, but I'm more than happy to, to enter into the discussion. Um, I'm, I'm open-minded to understand um, the, the, the members' bill he was taking forward, but I think it's a good point. I should probably be lost in much of the discussion around the offensive uh, weapons uh, legislation that's looking to be brought forward, so uh, I think uh, important to put on the record. McArthur? I, mean, I would share the Cabinet Secretary's uh, concern at um, delays in, the, uh, in taking forward this legislation at, at Westminster. You've talked about the, con the consensual approach to taking forward this uh, legislation to date. I'm slightly surprised if this is the second um, uh, delay that has taken place, why we're talking about writing to um, your equivalent uh, to seek 
clarification on the basis for that delay rather than uh, an urgent phone call having been set up uh, already uh, to establish that to impress upon uh, on your counterpart uh, why this legislation needs to be taken forward now. Nobody wants to see it taken forward at a, at a UK level and, and, and defeated for whatever reason. Um, I, I think we all, uh, we all appreciate that the management of legislation through Parliament can be a, a precarious business, but it, it seems to me um, beyond understanding uh, how this would fall into that category. And therefore, as I say, I'm slightly surprised that that conversation hasn't already happened between yourself and your, and your counterpart. Oh, I mean, uh, I'll say to Liam uh, MacArthur from, uh, again, my, my various kind of ministerial um, roles, it can be sometimes quicker, frankly, getting a letter sent via email than trying to wait for uh, diaries to, 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 to match up. Now, I would be available for a phone call uh, today with the relevant UK government uh, minister to discuss uh, the, the, this issue and I'll reflect on uh, what he says. I don't doubt... At an official level... Um, Either there's a precursor for Yeah, that. I'll bring my officials in to, 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 to um, they can talk about their, their conversations with UK government officials. The point I was going to make was I don't doubt that there are some uh, legitimate uh, issues that need to be discussed. Uh, I know, for example, uh, there is some points of contention around high calibre rifles, for example. That's an idea that's reserved, I should say. Um, but, I, but I know there are some discussions around uh, that as being a con point of contention. So I don't doubt that there are some issues that need to be worked through, but to continually pull legislation for it to be delayed, and if it is for the reasons it's being reported, then it is uh, extremely worrying. But I'm happy to bring in uh, Philip to perhaps um, uh, to, 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 to give more detail on the official discussions that have taken well, place. I, I can just confirm we didn't have advance notice of the delay. So we, we find out in live time, in the sense that it was due to go through the third reading last Monday, didn't happen on the day, and the same yesterday. So we, 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 we did not get advance notice that the UK government had made that decision. And what efforts have you made to establish at an official level what the, the rationale is? Because at the moment we're relying on reports and... Well, we, we, can, we can certainly ask at official level and ministerial level. Um, certainly the information we've received is due to kind of parliamentary scheduling without any further detail. That would be helpful. I think you've really impressed in us the need to, to move on with this in any way that we can get the information we need um, in the best manner possible and the most um, efficient and fastest manner possible would be, I think, in the interests of all concerned. Are there any more questions? If not, then do members agree that we give our consent and that you delegate the publication of a short factual report to me to work with the clerks and publish? Great, thank you for that. Agenda item five is legislative consent memorandum on crime overseas production orders. Cabinet Secretary, do you need a change of officials? Uh, yes. In which case I shall um, suspend for about 30 seconds <laughs> until that takes place. Right. This agenda item is consideration of legislative consent memorandum relating to the Crime and Overseas Production Orders Bill, currently before the UK Parliament, which touches upon devolved matters and to which the Scottish Government is recommending that this Parliament gives our consent to the UK Parliament to the relevant provisions in the Bill. I refer members to Paper 5, which is a note from the Clerk, and invite the Cabinet Secretary again to make... A brief opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener, for the opportunity to speak in support of the, the LCM for the Crime Overseas Production Orders Bill, which was introduced in the House of Lords on the 27th of uh, June. Uh, the purposes of the bill is to enable law enforcement officials and prosecutors to apply for a court order which would enable them to obtain electronic data for the purposes of investigating and prosecuting serious crimes uh, directly from persons who are based or operated overseas. Uh, at present, if data that may constitute evidence is located outside the UK, then UK courts can generally only access data through the current mutual legal assistance, uh, often known as the MLA process. This process requires a domestic order uh, and the engagement of domestic law enforcement from the territory in which the data is held. It can therefore be a slow and very cumbersome process, uh, taking on average uh, 10 months to complete. Uh, the bill seeks to create a more efficient process for obtaining data from overseas, meaning that evidence can be recovered more quickly. Uh, the default position is within seven days, beginning with the day in which the order 
uh, is served supporting swifter investigations and prosecutions. Uh, the new process will sit alongside the current uh, MLA uh, arrangements. The main elements of the bill are to allow a judge to make an overseas production order, to define data that is exempt from such orders, for example, medical records, uh, to set out what a person must do if they are served with an order, uh, and to allow a judge to vary or revoke an order. Uh, an LCM is required as it provides a, a means uh, for devolved law enforcement officials to seek electronic data evidence in relation to a wider range of serious offences, uh, many of which are not reserved. Uh, the bill also confers new functions uh, on the Lord Advocate, who is to serve orders made in Scotland, uh, thereby altering the executive competence of Scottish Ministers and uh, Asset Committee to support the draft LCM. Uh, my officials and I, of course, are more than happy to take questions that you may have. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. John. The Cabinet Secretary has covered the point I was going to raise. Thank okay, you. That's fine. Are there any other questions for members? If not, do members agree that we give our consent and that you delegate the publication of a short factual report to me to work with the clerks and publish? Have we all agreed? agreed. Right. I suspend briefly to let the Cabinet Secretary to leave. Due to the um, clock ticking on, we will continue now. Uh, agenda item six, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Agenda item six is consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act in relation to a UK statutory instrument, the Law Enforcement and Security Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018. 18. I refer members to paper six, which is a note by the clerk. Do members have any questions? John. Uh, thank you, Convener. I will be brief. Um, the, the, the papers we have got, as you say, cover a, a range of issues and the, the repeat a number of stock phrases in regard to it, namely that a lot of, uh, for instance, given the UK is a member state, the UK Government are leading negotiations um, and need to be considered on a UK-wide basis. The Scottish Government shares the UK's uh, Government's aim. I have no difficulty in with that. We then come to a phrase that I, the, if any legislation is considered necessary to plug gaps, it will most likely need to be progressed at UK-wide basis. Now, there's also an undertaking that the Justice Committee would be kept informed of that, but I, I wonder if, I think it would be helpful to qualify uh, the term likely and what capability or opportunity exists for the Scottish criminal justice system to address this issues on its own. This would cover the situation where, as we've heard with not the previous item, but the one before that, for any reason, because these are very, very important matters, child pornography and, the, you know, um, and, and other pressing issues. So could we clarify that, please? Uh, would you be content then for us to seek that further information and to receive that, but to be able to go on and approve the... V very happy that we go on and approve yeah. it. I think it would be helpful to understand that. Position. I think that's Thank an important you. point. Thank you very much for making it, John. Um, is the committee therefore content to recommend that the Scottish Parliament gives its consent to the UK Government to pass this statutory instrument? You are agreed. And that uh, the clerks will produce a paper. Uh, a short report is committee happy to delegate the authority to me to publish this, uh, uh, me to publish this report as we do with SSIs. Are we all agreed? Yeah, thank you. Agenda item number seven is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 4th October 2018. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions. And I refer members to paper seven, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney to provide this feedback. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, as you say, the, Justice, uh, the Subcommittee on Policing met on the 4th of October and we took pre-budget evidence on Police Scotland's digital data and ICT strategy ahead of the Scottish Government's publication of its draft budget. We heard from uh, senior officials of uh, um, Police Scotland and the Police Authority. And we also heard that lessons had been learned from the failed I-6 project and measures had been taken to, to avoid uh, these being repeated. And that was primarily around a, a, an incremental approach to the implementation and selection of technology uh, that's been previously tested and used elsewhere, rather than the whole innovation that associated itself with I-6. Um, uh, we, we heard of the importance of the issue, and we heard, as we've touched on earlier in our meeting here, that the ICT strategy would require uh, 
298 million funding from the Scottish Government, but there would be implications for a standstill budget. We, also took, uh, we were also told that the capital budget for Police Scotland is insufficient to meet its needs, and can this consider that the impact on policing of the reduction of police support staff and the proposed reduction of uh, 300 officers for 1920? We next meet on the 20th of 5th of uh, October. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank Thank Do members have any questions? No. I thought that was a useful meeting and it emphasised um, this process of a pre-budget um, you know, scrutiny, how effective that was. I think it's been a very welcome introduction. Um, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be the 30th of October, where we will continue with our post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. And I now move into private session. <laughs>